as we um, challenge ourselves in this new technological era of remote oral arguments, we will inevitably have some glitches. So I appreciate everyone's patience and I, I'll take this opportunity to say uh, hello to Mr. Engel. It's good to see you um, back and, and looking well. So. Uh, thank you very much. And and uh, I was just, I came across your letter just the other day and, and I really appreciate it. That it meant a lot to me. Okay, Judge, we're uh, live. Alrighty. All persons having business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judge is now residing over the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. Draw near and give your attention. God save this United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please come to order. Good morning uh, and welcome to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals uh, remote oral arguments. Uh, today we will be hearing uh, three cases. Um, I am uh, Chief Judge Blackburn Rigsby. I'm joined on the panel this morning by Judge McLeese and Judge Deal. Um, as we um, go forward with our remote oral arguments, we appreciate your patience um, and the patience of those who may be uh, watching live on YouTube um, as we may um, from time to time have some technological uh, glitches but we will move forward ahead and thank you all for being here this morning. Our first case today is uh, Ulysses uh, Goodine versus United States. Um, are, is counsel ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. If it please the court and counsel, my name is Thomas Engel and I represent the appellant in this case. I'd like to start uh, with speaking about what this case is not about. This case is not about ineffective assistance of counsel. If appellant had to have an attorney, then he was satisfied with the trial counsel that had been appointed to him. He was asked that several times by the trial judge and indicated that he was satisfied with that particular lawyer. This is also not a case about hybrid representation. There's no claim here that the court should have permitted appellant to represent himself and have an attorney at the same time. What this case is about is appellant's desire to represent himself. And it's an unusual case as the government, the appellant, uh, mostly agree on the facts. Uh, we mostly agree on the applicable law and the standard of review. Mr. Engel, if I could um, ask you, uh, stop you at that point, just to um, press you for clarification. Here, the government and uh, appellant counsel agree, as you said, on the core facts, which show three different judges um, each having a series of colloquies over a period of a uh, couple of years while the case was, uh, or maybe it was a few months while the case was pending, that, that clearly um, uh, show not just a perfunctory, are you sure you want to represent yourself, uh, but a, a de several detailed colloquies about whether or not Mr. Goodine was um, asking to proceed without counsel. And each time he, um, as the record seems to clearly indicate, unequivocally um, said, I want to retain my counsel. I want to go forward with my counsel. How, how if there's agreement on those facts, which are clear in the record, um, how in your view does that satisfy our cases? Um, we have several Supreme Court cases and cases from this court saying that the appellant or the defendant must clearly positively state that they want to represent themselves. Um, I think I part company with you uh, with the notion that he ever um, indicated that he did not wish to represent himself. What he was always, although he filed a motion that said, I wish to proceed pro se, I wish to waive counsel. The colloquies with the judges were always, do you like this attorney? Is this attorney okay? Are you satisfied with the, this attorney? It, it's apples and oranges. Well, no, uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't the extent of some of the colloquies. Um, um, uh, I don't remember whether it was Judge uh, Leibowitz, Leibowitz or Judge DeMeo said, you know, I see that you filed some motions on your own, but you have an attorney. Um, how, how do you wish to proceed? Um, and so the, the colloquies seem to encompass the whole scope of ongoing conversations and requests 
both in writing and in the court with Mr. Goodine? Um, I, I don't think that the colloquies go to that extent. I think they're always directed at, are you satisfied with this lawyer? Um, there's been these problems uh, and that kind of thing. He was never asked specifically, are you wait, are you once told us that you want to waive counsel? Have you changed that position? Never was that asked of him. Mr. Uh, Engel, you, you, in referring to the motion and then just a minute ago, uh, you, or a second ago, you said uh, that uh, your client <laughs> did indicate he wanted to proceed pro se and represent himself. And uh, could you point me to where in the written motion that you think that was uh, clearly and unequivocally communicated? Uh, yes, Judge McLeese, uh, right at the title of the pleading, we'll start right there, the very title of the pleading, what the pleading is about. The title says, motion to waive my counsel partially to the extent needed to participate in the preparation of the defense and participating in my own uh, defense. Well, and the, 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 the government focuses on the adverb there partially and uh, argues that what that really would nor normally be understood as the title and then the text later on is has a similar the exact same term in it that that like is not a request to proceed solely pro se in toto uh, but rather was a request for a partial waiver of counsel to allow the defendant to actively participate by filing motions and so i'm interested in your response to that focusing on again the ordinary understanding of the word partially i'd like to speak to that if i may it's important to look at how appellant used the word partially. Appellant titled his pleading, as I just quoted, uh, that he wishes to uh, waive his right to counsel partially to the extent needed to participate in the preparation of the defense and participating in my own defense. Whatever extent it would take, appellant put the trial court on notice that he wanted to prepare and participate in his own defense and would waive counsel for that to happen. His very words were that he would waive counsel to the extent needed. Now, under the law, we know that the extent needed would be for the trial court to discharge counsel. The record doesn't indicate anything to undercut the notion that appellant was not willing to go to any extent needed to participate in his own defense. Well, does the record indicate, on the other hand, though, if the burden is on him to make a clear and unequivocal request, is the burden on him to make clear that it's not just that I want to participate in my defense to the extent the law will permit uh, with still having a lawyer, but uh, I'm willing to take that to the point of getting rid of my lawyer in toto. I mean, I understand the point you're making, which is that this is at least that you could say it's ambiguous and you could say, well, look, you say you want to participate in your defense, but you really don't have a constitutional right to do that because hybrid representation isn't constitutionally permissible. So, you know, what do you want to do if I tell you, look, either you're going to have no lawyer and you're on your own, or you're going to have your lawyer and you're not going to be able to file motions. What do you want? I would say from this written document, I just don't know, which nobody really pushed him to the point of that question. I think that's fair, but that just means, or arguably that means that it's kind of an ambiguous request that could perhaps reasonably be understood in isolation, leave aside what the later colloquies uh, show, uh, but just in isolation, it seems to me it poses a question at best rather than clearly indicating a willingness to go completely without any assistance of counsel. I, I, I take your point. I, I think though, when you say to the extent necessary, you've put the trial court on notice that whatever extent necessary is that's the extent you're gonna go to. And well, but Mr. Engel, um, that motion preceded um, um, several of the colloquies, at least two of the colloquies. And so the judges were on, on notice that he had filed that motion and the conversations that they had with him pick up from that motion. You know, Judge, Judge DeMeo saying, you know, you said you wanna file some motions on your behalf. You said that you're concerned that your attorney's not filing as many motions as, as frequently then Judge Leibowitz picks up when she gets the, tr uh, the case and she says, you've said a couple of times before that you want um, to be able to file motions, but you're, you're, the, the deadline hasn't even passed yet before some of the motions that you say you want your attorney to file. Um, so he was always talking in this uh, sort of duality of, I wanna file some motions, I want my attorney to file more motions. And, um, and so, each time it seems the judges follow up on that. Follow I, on, and the, that being the motion um, for partial 
um, ability to participate. Uh, and they clarify that you, you can't really do that here. You have to decide which way to go. And each time he clearly decides to go with his counsel. And I, I part company with you there too, because I think what, what happened during those colloquies is we're talking apples and oranges. Um, the appellant is saying, has said, to whatever extent necessary, I want to waive counsel because I want to file my motions. The judges are starting a different conversation with him. Are you happy with the lawyer that you have? Are you willing to work with the lawyer that you have? Those are apples and oranges. Those are two different conversations. But I think, and if I may, I think actions speak louder than words. And I, I think that appellant's actions here permit, his, permit us to understand his words. He was, as you say, he was told that if his counsel, having counsel meant that his motions wouldn't be considered. He then filed five motions, including his motion to wa waive uh, his right to counsel. That would be a meaningless waste of time if he were still intended to represent counsel, be represented by counsel, because he had been told that if you file motions, we're not going to consider them if you have counsel. It would be a total waste of time. I, I think those actions reinforce that appellant intended to waive counsel. Otherwise, it would make no sense to file those motions since he'd been told that they wouldn't be considered. He had but, no but is, that, is, that, is that an unequivocal positive statement that I want to proceed as our case law indicates, like uh, Wheat and Patterson Perry, Perry um, that you, it can't, it has to be clear and positive. And what you're suggesting is that the judges should have tried to glean and, and, and intuit from his actions as opposed to uh, what the cases seem to require a positive statement in response to questions and and in in court um, before the before the judge I, I was trying to just respond directly to your question chief judge Blackburn Rigsby um, I think where the Sir, can I ask you, let, me, let me ask you the, the I mean it seems to me that uh, sorry if someone hears a dog barking in the background I think that's my uh, son's dog um, the the um, if the, if the trial judge here had responded to the written motion by saying, well, you said that you're going to waive partially to the extent needed to file motions. The law says that if you want to file a motion, you have no, you can have no lawyer. So I interpret your request as to be entirely on your own without a lawyer. And I hereby discharge your lawyer and require you to represent yourself. Don't you think that that would have been uh, pretty uh, uh, thrill seeking as a trial judge uh, I, 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 I think, you know, uh, if that had happened, I would see a good defense lawyer on appeal saying, my motion said partially to the extent, and I never suggested that I wanted to be completely on my own without a lawyer. I was very interested in having someone, you know, uh, I was very interested in filing some motions, but I never said I was willing to go it on my own. Um, don't you think that would be a pretty good uh, appellate argument if the trial court had responded to the motion in the way that you're suggesting the trial court was obliged to? I can promise you, I'll never. I would never make that argument. Um, I think where we, where I come down on, is that the appellant positively, to to use Judge Blackburn Rigby's um, phrasing, positively said to the extent necessary. That's how far I'll go. How far will you go? I will go to the extent necessary to represent myself to have my own motions filed. I mean, and mod modified by the word partially at all times, though. I mean, partially is in the heading, partially is in the sentence that you're quoting. So he's willing to partially relieve his counsel of duties to the extent necessary. At no point does he say that I will wholesale dismiss counsel if that's necessary. I mean, just, just taking your own like argument on its, on its terms. Um, I think to the extent necessary swallows partially. I mean, it appears, I mean, he would have liked apparently to, to partially waive it, but whatever extent necessary, that's how far he would go. If he, if he could just do it partially, hey, that would be great. But the, the words, the phrase that swallows up everything else is to the extent necessary. Why, sh why would, should, why should uh, to the extent necessary swallow up partially rather than vice versa or you know, partially would swallow up to the extent necessary or maybe uh, uh, at best that the, to the extent the two words point you in different directions, it's unclear which Mr. Uh, Goodine would prefer. Because I think partially, I mean, you can't modify that by to the extent. I, I, I think you're, when you deal with partially, that is the extent necessary. I think it has to go that way because that's the that's the that's the bigger phrase. 
the, to the whatever extent necessary. If it's partially, that's that's encompassed within. It's encompassed within. Well, I mean, to that necessary. Well, only only one of those phrases is in the heading of the motion and recurs repeatedly. Remind me, you know, I was just looking at the July 5th motion. That's and the part that says to the extent necessary is not excerpted in your brief, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is it? So I was just looking for it. Can you just point me to where in the July 5th motion it is exactly? Just because I, I, I don't have it up. It's in the exact title and it's underlined. It's in the title and it's underlined. Got it. Yeah. Well, my mistake. Sorry, counsel. With that, I'll. I'll I was going to, I have a minute left. I'll reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. All right. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Um, uh, Mr. Hobbel. Uh, good morning. Uh, may it please the court, Mark Hobel for the United States. Um, the uh, appellant's uh, position here is that um, he clearly, by asking to partially um, waive the right to counsel to file motions, that was clearly and unequivocally asking to completely waive his right to counsel and proceed pro se. And the government disagrees. Um, if this were a matter of ordinary construction, uh, for example, statutory construction, construction of a term of a contract, that wouldn't even be the best possible thing. Um, partially implies pretty clearly um, that it is, that this is a request for hybrid representation. But Mr. Mr. Hobel, oh, sorry to jump in on the hybrid representation point. The, the trial judge had discretion to allow hybrid re representation. It's not a constitutional right, but the trial judges could, in this case, have said, okay, uh, we'll exercise our discretion to allow you to partially represent yourself and file some motions. Couldn't that have been an option here? Um, that would have been within, yes, that would have been within the, the trial judge's discretion. And I think two, two judges, Judge DeMeo and Judge Leibovitz, did, did not exercise their discretion in that way. But uh, again, it is- Do you think that they recognize that they had the discretion to do that? And, and if they didn't recognize that, would that be a basis um, for us to find any any uh, abuse of discretion here. Right, well, I think I think importantly as, as to that, uh, appellants made clear here at argument that they're not challenging any denial of, of hybrid representation or uh, uh, the right to partially waive counsel. They put all their eggs in the basket of asking to partially waive counsel was a clear and unequivocal request to proceed completely pro se without counsel. But, um, in terms of how this the, the the situation here was handled by Judge Leibovitz, especially there there was no abuse of discretion. It was entirely within her discretion to be, and in fact, probably preferable to be clear about how she was going to treat pro se motions while he was represented by counsel. Um, now, um, as I was noting, the the even if this was a matter of ordinary construction of that July 5th motion, um, it would not be the best possible reading to say partially, uh, requesting to partially waive counsel is a request to go pro se completely. Um, and, but this course requires a clear and unequivocal statement, um, or clear, clear and unequivocal positive demand to proceed pro se um, and so that is an even higher bar, and that's before you even get to the need to conduct a Feretta inquiry. In, in this case, is, is I think the court has, has uh, I think the court is, has, has, as the court has asked, the, the partial, using the term partially twice to modify, I think was not only not a clear and unequivocal request to um, to proceed pro se entirely, it was a, it was a fairly clear request to have hybrid representation. And again, they're not challenging that and they weren't constitutionally entitled to that. And I think your honor, Chief Judge Blackburn Rigsby raised the question of these colloquies that came after that. I think those colloquies just reinforce, um, just reinforce uh, what, the, what the defendant was actually asking for here, which was the ability to file motions and the fact that he was satisfied with his, with his, uh, with his representation, but um, uh, he never requested to represent himself completely. Um, so 
unless there are any further questions, um, we would ask that the court affirm uh, appellant's convictions. Um, let me just ask you briefly in, in, in case Mr. Engel wants to address this on rebuttal. Um, uh, your brief, uh, I know, contends that there were, were no errors with respect to the other issues that um, Mr. Goodine raised. Did you want to address any of those other? Um, I, I think with respect to the, to the mistrial issue, um, the, the, the standard here is plain error. So it had to be <clears throat> clear and obvious as a matter of this court's precedent or the Supreme Court's precedent, clear and obvious that even though the defense didn't request a mistrial here, even though the jury is presumed to follow curative instructions, um, that nevertheless, the, the, the trial judge should have blown up the trial and declared a mistrial right then and there, that it was just, it should have been obvious to the judge, even though the defense didn't ask for it. And it is, it, it is an enormous, there are enormous hurdles for, for, for appellant to, to climb to make that claim, and, and he hasn't met them. Um, as to the self-defense claim, I would just say that even, even if he'd been allowed to, to, there really was no error here because there was no, there was no relevance to um, the fact that the, the victim had a, had a BB gun, you know, more than a year after this incident was, was not relevant in any way to, to whether he was armed on, on that night. Um, so again, we're asking uh, that the trial, that this court affirm the trial court. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Engel, uh, you had reserved a, a, a minute or so for rebuttal. You're uh, on Engel. mute, Mr. Engel. You're still on mute, Mr. Engel. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, we will submit uh, on the briefs as written. All right. Well, uh, we wish to thank counsel for their briefs and arguments um, and the cases submitted at this time. And uh, uh, while counsel exits from the virtual courtroom, um, we'll prepare for the second case. Thank you. Thank you. Council is present. All right. Um, are we waiting? Uh, we're still waiting for um, uh, one other attorney to join us. Good morning, Council. Good morning, Your Honor. Audio is still connected. All right, good morning, Council. Um, um, and uh, welcome to our virtual oral arguments this morning. Um, this is the second case um, in the matter of Nancy Parker et al. versus U.S. Trust Com Company et al. Um, Council, are you ready to proceed? We are on behalf of the appellant, Cross Appellee. All right. Yes, Your Honor, good morning. All right, may I ask how you uh, like to use your time with uh, respect to the appeal and the cross appeal? On behalf of the appellant cross appellee, I would like to reserve two minutes of my argument for rebuttal. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, uh, you can proceed, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please this court. Uh, my name is William Cornwell, along with David Camino. Um, we represent Nancy and Ellis J. Parker. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Parker, who are both now in their 80s, have been trying for over 17 years to recover property wrongly taken by Bank of America in its capacity as uh, personal representative of the estate 
of Nancy's father and the Parker's partner in a company, an LLC known as Hartford E. Beeler LLC. I, Mr. Cornwall, uh, are they actually trying to recover the property or the value of the property? Because of the tortured procedural history of the case, which you'll see in the papers, we were limited at trial to recovering the value of the property and the income that had been taken during the um, now almost 17 years that, that this uh, dispute has, has raged on. Right, but so there's no claim at this uh, juncture for the actual property. It's just for the valuation of the property. That's correct. And that will become real clear in just a moment, I think, as I try to explain that some of this tortured procedural history. Um, under the operating agreement for Hartford E. Beeler LLC, which I'm going to refer to as the LLC, Mr. Beeler's death, first and foremost, ended his membership. Um, that's under the operating agreement 12C and paragraph 13. And it triggered an option for the remaining members to purchase the member interest of the deceased uh, former member at a very favorable price. That was one third of the assessed DC value, of the three uh, apartment buildings owned by the LLC. Less Can I ask you about that, that one third figure? Do you think that one third figure would have to be reformed in virtue of the fact that there are other aspects of the partnership agreement seem to have been drawn up or, or the, the, the operating agreement? Uh, seem to have been drawn up on the assumption that there would be three partners, but then ultimately are members and then there ended up only being two so that really that number, like some of the other numbers would have to be sort of reformulated to the actual practical realities of the LLC that was created in fact. I don't believe so. The bank never requested reformation of the operating agreement. And, and as I'm going to get to in a minute, or I'll get to it right now, this case, as you know, has been before this court before. And uh, there are specific holdings that governed the proceedings afterwards. The court found as a matter of law that uh, the members, because only two of the three executed the operating agreement were by law 50-50 owners of the business. It didn't change the term um, set forth in the operating agreement for the strike price for exercising the option. Um, uh, initially, Bank of America denied the existence of the LLC, its operating agreement, or any interests of the Parkers in the company or its property. Uh, litigation had to be instituted, and in 2007, the initial trial judge entered summary judgment on the bank's behalf based on the argument that the operating agreement requires at least two members to, opt, to exercise this option to continue the business and Bank of America had successfully argued to the trial court there was only one member who remained, whether it was Nancy Parker or Nancy Parker and her husband, Ellis J. Parker, Parker as tenants by the entireties. Uh, this court reversed that summary judgment, finding there were issues of fact that precluded the entry of summary judgment on at least two bases. One, that the operating agreement was ambiguous about who the parties intended to be members from the outset whether Mr. and Mrs. Parker were to be two separate members who could validly elect to continue the business, or, and um, there was an instrument executed, an amendment to the operating agreement by Mr. and Mrs. Parker within uh, 30 days of Mr. Beeler's death in which they severed the tenancies by the entirety. She transferred half her interest to her husband, Mr. Parker, and they elected in that instrument to continue the business and and Council, can I can I just ask a factual question that uh, it's yeah. slipping my mind what when we uh, reversed last time remember we quite clearly said there's a factual issue as to whether or not um, both Miss and Mr. Parker were, were members of this agreement at the time of the death I don't remember if we so specifically flagged that there was still a factual issue as to whether or not he was properly brought into the agreement posthumously. Um, it, was that, do we, we talk about that at all as a possibility? Absolutely. It was addressed okay. in the opinion in, in great detail. And in fact, the, the opinion expressed the view that A, the operating agreement allowed the election to occur within 90 days. This instrument was uh, executed within 30 days and the election contained in it certainly was made within the 90 day requirement. There's nothing in the oper operating agreement that precluded this. Um, it, it really can, can I ask you, did I understand you correctly to just say you read our earlier opinion as deciding the, and concluding 
that the operating agreement allowed for an election to add a new member sort of after uh, um, uh, the, they had gotten down to one. Um, I, I, I am, right now, as I'm recalling it, I thought our opinion was more in the nature of, it's at least ambiguous about that and it calls for a trial. You're, is there a part of the opinion where you think we definitively said as a matter of law, the way to interpret this agreement is to allow um, uh, uh, it, it, uh, a sort of uh, posthumous relative to the original partner um, uh, addition during the, the the 90 day window, I think it was. Uh, is, there, is there a place where you think we definitively decided that? I think it did. I, I hate trying to parse uh, an appellate court's opinion, but it, it clearly was raised as an issue on the appeal and was cited as a basis for reversal. And, and the court used the three A's. It, it said that on remand, if this issue is reached, the, the court would have to determine the admissibility, the authenticity, and the effect of the document. But it went on to state it clearly was executed within the 90-day period permitted for election under the operating agreement. It, it would have made little sense to say those things and to point out there were factual issues that had to be fleshed out in order to resolve that issue if, as a matter of law, the court's view of, of, of that document was that it couldn't do what the bank contends it couldn't do. Oh, I agree with what you just said, but that is a little bit, so I, I, I mean, I think uh, there's a good argument, a reasonable argument that we either explicitly or implicitly indicated that the, the operating agreement was at least ambiguous about whether it allowed uh, that kind of an addition of Mr. Parker uh, after Mr. Bueller's death. Um, but I, I, I don't know that, that, that you had originally, I thought, said something beyond that, which was we'd actually decided as a matter of law that that's how you have to interpret the operating agreement. And I, I didn't recall that we had gone quite that far. If I said that, I, I may have misspoken. I didn't mean that. What I meant was that it was certainly uh, referred to as containing issues of fact that needed to be fleshed out that would preclude summary judgment. And paragraph 12A of the operating agreement clearly provides that uh, new members may be admitted by the unanimous consent of the members. At the time this occurred, the only member, and this was the bank's argument, the only member was Nancy Parker, and they're right, because Mr. Beeler had passed away, and whether you conclude that Mr. and Mrs. Parker constitute one member or two members, Miss or one member, Miss uh, Parker clearly consented to the transfer and admission of her husband as a member in the LLC. Can you, can you just, counsel, can you just remind me, so I, I believe Appley says to that, well, upon his death, the bank steps in his shoes and is effectively a member of the operating agreement. And therefore, in order to have unanimous consent of the members, um, you would have needed the bank's consent. Uh, and that was lacking. So, and what, just remind me your response to that. They cite the Washington DC LLC statute for that proposition. And that proposition provides that if the operating agreement does not provide otherwise. This operating agreement clearly does provide otherwise. Um, it says that once a member passes away, it, it no longer has voting rights. In it. Um, and it says in the event of death of a member, the withdrawing member is how they refer to, and in the further event that the other members elect to continue the company, um, it goes on to set forth this very favorable price. Um, and, and it's obvious from paragraph 12C which says, unless named in the agreement or otherwise admitted to the company in accordance with the terms of the agreement, no person or entity shall be considered a member. Well, the bank was never admitted. Um, in fact, the Parkers would have vehemently contested their admission. Well, um, but did the bank uh, uh, need to be admitted if, yes. if the terms of the agreement said that the bank would step into the shoes of Mr. Bueller? Mr. Bueller, upon his death, uh, you know, his rights may have ceased, but the bank is asserting a different right to step into his his shoes. Um, and is your is your position that they didn't have the right to step into his shoes under the agreement, or that if they did step into his shoes, they wouldn't have had the right to vote because Mr. Bueller's voting rights ended when he died? It's, it seems to be a, an interesting conundrum or a bit of a circular argument there. Well, the, the, the operating agreement specifically provides, that it, it even says, in the absence of the substitution of a member for an assigning or deceased member, any uh, of an assigning, any payment to, wait a minute, I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I, 
they, it says the company, each member and any other person or entity having business with the company need only deal with members so named or admitted. They shall not be required to deal with any other person or entity by reason of an assignment by a member or by reason of the death or termination of a member. So clearly the operating agreement under paragraph 12C contemplated that the members who remained after the death of a member were not required to deal with and, and uh, have any, the, the, the deceased had no longer had voting rights. Um, and that's paragraph 12C of, of the operating agreement. Um, um, the bank relies on a statute that says if this isn't present in the operating agreement, it has the right to step into the shoes. Uh, Mr. Wow. Uh, Cornwell, can I can I take you to the issue of damages, if if yes, you will? Why do you argue that you're entitled to the full 5.03 million in damages? I mean, doesn't paragraph 13 of the operating agreement require the Parkers to purchase Mr. Bueller's interest, and therefore wouldn't they be entitled to less than this 5.3 million amount? Had the bank not uh, self-helped, quite frankly, and transferred the property out of the LLC during the pendency of this appeal and taken all of the income for the entire 17 years since Mr. Beeler passed away, that might be the case. But the bank, while getting summary judgment, arguing that Ms. Parker was the sole remaining member and thus couldn't continue the LLC, executed no consideration deeds, naming itself as the managing member of the LLC and deeded the properties out of the LLC. So there was no LLC after that. And, and this was during the pendency of the appeal before the opinion was issued um, and, and has refused to place the property back in the LLC. We tendered the amount long before the, the summary judgment was entered and we've tendered the amount since judgment was entered. But uh, the, the strike price, meaning one third of the DC assessed value, less 10%, is what we were required to pay to obtain the member interest of the deceased person, Mr. Beeler. It Can made I just... no sense after the, the property and that had been taken from the LLC and the bank had, had without notice to or, or any consent of the Parkers, dissolved the company. Council, council, this, I mean, I, this is, might be small potatoes in the grand context of this case. Uh, but I think maybe going back to Judge McLeese's first question is, you know, at the time of his death, um, Mr. Parker had half, owned, owned a 50% share of this LLC, right? And the one third strike price uh, was contemplated, assuming there were three people. I mean, the, the agreement entirely was drawn up on the assumption that there were three people. And I, I think um, it would seem that you would have to pay uh, at least half and not a third as a strike price uh, in order to buy out that half share. Is, is, I mean, you not, disagree with- I, I don't argue with the panel that issue. I, all I point out is that issue has never been raised by the bank and it wasn't an issue that was um, litigated or argued below. Okay. Can I ask you then, but uh, in, with respect to your answer to uh, uh, Chief Judge Barkharipi's question, um, if you and I own property together and we have a, you know, some uh, a divided interest in it and I uh, wrongfully take it and sell it off, and maybe there was a contractual agreement about how you could buy it out for me, I get your point that if you can't get the property back and you can't reconstruct the LLC, then maybe the strike price isn't a good measure of damages anymore. So I got, I have that point, if that's part of your point. But then if the question is, you then sue me and say, I want damages, it seems odd that you would be entitled to the entirety of the, the value of the property we jointly own. And again, the bank here is standing in as a personal representative of uh, uh, the, the, the estate of uh, Mr. Beeler, I, I assume. Um, uh, so it seems as though you'd have to figure out an actual appropriate amount of damages with respect to, let's assume for a moment, the wrongful um, uh, taking of the assets of the LLC. You would have to get into the question of what, you know, what the capital accounts were and who was entitled to what of the assets of the LLC. If you're not using the strike price as the measure, then it seems like there would still need to be some complicated inquiries rather than just using the, the, the $5 million valuation. Have I gone awry there somewhere? 
I think you have, and let me explain why. The strike price has never been a measure of damage. It was simply the amount, the favorable amount that had to be paid to acquire the interest. And since they took the interest, all of the assets out of the company, the courts, in fact, said we couldn't sue for conversion, couldn't pursue those claims for anything they did during the pendency of the appeal, but we could recover presumably the value of the property. We've never said we don't owe the estate the strike price, one third of the DC assessed value, less 10% that was tendered back in 2003. It's been tendered again since judgment was entered as an offset against the income. And we have a situation here where the jury concluded this business was validly continued by the Parkers and they gave them the, all the income from the date of Mr. Beeler's death through the date of, of the uh, last report prior to the jury verdict. But I think they thought that when they concluded that the business was validly continued by the Parkers, they would step back into ownership of the company with the property in it. We would have obviously had to pay, and we've never said anything different than we have to pay that price that's set forth in the operating agreement to acquire that interest. Can I ask you, I want to make sure I understand. So we've been talking about this as a topic that relates to damages with respect to the breach of contract claim that was tried to the jury in the trial that's currently uh, on appeal. I know that you had sought to have separate counts for breach of fiduciary duty and you mentioned conversion. And uh, am I right in understanding that it is a co component of your current appeal that you would like those counts reinstated and be able to have a trial with that, that might uh, uh, establish liability and uh, award damages with respect to those counts, or are you seeking solely to uh, uh, s recover damages in the context of the breach of contract count that was actually tried to the jury here? In our post-trial motion to the judge uh, to alter or amend the judgment, we indicated, we believe that first of all, the damages were stipulated to the value of the properties that were taken out of the company. Can I ask, my, just to clarify, my question is about what you are seeking in this court. And, and our, my answer is we either want a new trial on damages. There's no reason to have a liability trial. The jury's determination of whether we, in fact, validly uh, executed the uh, resolution creating two members and then, who then simultaneously elected to continue the business, that, that jury finding is valid. There's no reason to go back and revisit that issue. Let me clarify my question yet again. I understand you are not seeking a liability uh, trial with respect to the breach of contract claim that was tried. I understand that you're not seeking further litigation of damages with respect to the uh, proceeds, uh, you know, the income of the LLC during the period in question. So I know for sure you're seeking further litigation, uh, you know, further trial on damages that relates to the, uh, the, what, what you take as a breach of contract uh, in the taking of the property. Um, but let me ask you, my, my question was, are you seeking to reinstate and have a full trial on, or, or not to reinstate, but to have a full trial, both liability and damages with respect to counts other than breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, conversion, uh, 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 I'm forgetting whether there was a fourth. There was uh, an accounting claim that the court- an account, right, uh, Yeah, an accounting claim. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to, do you, do you want liability uh, retrial, if you got a retrial, would you want to retry those counts or try those counts really more precisely? If the court is disinclined to instate the verdict for the damages the party stipulated to, then yes, we would seek to have a trial on the conversion. And, and if we pr don't prevail on, on the claims, the accounting is, is a, a offshoot or a byproduct. The, the bank has taken the property under the wrong interpretation of the operating agreement that, that the estate's entitled to the assets of the company without an accounting. Uh, Can I ask you, you said the damages the party stipulated to, and I'm sure your opponent uh, was uh, uh, bristling. I, I, I don't, I, I don't, he wasn't visibly bristling, so I don't mean to apply anything like that, but I imagine that he was internally bristling. Uh, there was a stipulation as to what the valuation of the assets of the LLC would have been at a particular time. But you're not suggesting that there was a stipulation that that was a measure, an appropriate measure of damages of anything, or are you? I think, I think the two are one and the same. Stipulating that the value of the properties we took out of the LLC was five million dollars when they had no right to take them out of the LLC. If the jury concluded they did not have that right, which the jury did conclude, is tantamount to exactly what you just said and what I'm arguing. I guess that's where I lose you because I was asking, you know, again, if 
you and I jointly own some property and it's in a, a, an LLC or some other corporate entity. And I take out, you know, we each have some undetermined amount of interest. I have 40, you have 60, who knows, hasn't been determined. And I wrongfully take it out and take all of it for myself. Uh, you certainly would have a cause of action against me, but I don't know that the full value of the asset would be a reasonable measure of the damage. You'd have to figure out by getting into the weeds of, well, what does the operating agreement say about who is entitled at the end of the day to the proceeds of this if it ends up being wrapped up? And that might get you into capital accounts and some of the issues that there was some evidence on. With all due uh, respect, I, with all go ahead, respect. No, go ahead. tell me where I'm, uh, I'm uh, This uh, operating uh, agreement doesn't say what your honor just said. It says one third of the DC assessed value, less 10% at the date of Mr. Beeler's death is all. Well, that's a, that, 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 yes, but that's a strike price. That is, that, that's one possible measure of damages. One possible measure of damages would be figure out the whole value and then subtract the strike price because that's how it could have been done properly. That would be one measure of damages. Another measure of damages might be, but that was if the, another way of looking at it would be, well, that's on the theory that the LLC is a going concern. Now it's really not a going concern. There's no way we can, uh, get the property back. So the real question is they've kind of destroyed an LLC. And let's imagine instead that the LLC got wrapped up uh, um, in some other way. But in any event, either way, either through the strike price or through, you know, either through the strike price or through the terms of the operating agreement, the, the full value of the remaining assets wouldn't necessarily be a correct measure of damages, would it? No, sure they would, because had the bank not stepped in as an outsider and taken the property, the Parkers would have exercised that um, strike price, as we've been referring to it, one third of the DC assessed value, less 10 percent. And they would have owned these properties entirely and the value and the appreciation and value during the 17 years this dispute has gone on would be theirs, along with what the jury well, is. I, I mean, that rests on a factual assumption, maybe not yet proven, that they actually would have been in a position to exercise the, the uh, you know, they would have been able to to make that acquisition. Maybe they would. I don't know whether that'd be disputed or not, but yeah, that's they, just an assumption about what would have happened that is subject to empirical proof, right? Let, let me be clear about this. There's never been any dispute that the Parkers offered and tendered, proffered the strike price and the bank. Right. So I, I think we're going down a rabbit trail that frankly is not what this case was ever about. The measure of damages was only made difficult by the fact that the bank, frankly, fraudulently misrepresented and recorded instruments that it was the managing member of this LLC and took the property away from the LLC while this dis dispute was going on. They didn't obtain judicial intervention. They never even sought relief in the court below. They were just purely defensive. And so, to say, because we won summary judgments that's on a, appeal, we can now go take everything is, is the problem that, cr that is you're elucidating was cre that created this damages issue. Can I ask you one, one last question that kind of anticipates one of your, well, uh, focuses on an argument your opponent makes. One of the arguments your opponent makes is with respect to damages relating to the assets of the LLC. The argument is, look, you had a trial on breach of contract, and you actually did have the opportunity to prove up those damages with respect to the breach of contract claim in this uh, trial, and you introduced some evidence about it. You introduced the $5 million approximate uh, valuation, and there was an argument, and there's a mention in closing argument by counsel uh, uh, for the Parkers that, you know, one of the things that happened here is that, uh, you know, the Parkers ended up not having the, their asset. And so, your opponent's argument is you actually tried this issue and the jury resolved it unfavorably to you and you're trying to get a second bite at the apple. I wanted to just give you a chance to address that line of your opponent's argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the jury, quite frankly, found without any equivocation that the Parkers, as two members validly elected within 90 days of Ms. Parker's father's death, to continue the LLC in exact accordance with the operating agreement. That's what their finding on a special interrogatory was, is that they validly elected to continue the LLC. That encompasses within it that they made the offer to pay the strike price set forth in the, in the contract and were thus entitled to continue the business. That was ruined by the, by the bank taking the property and dissolving the company during the pendency of the lawsuit. So I'm not sure I follow the thing you just said. I, I understand the idea that I mean, the jury's verdict is very clear that the jury thought 
that Mr. Parker became a member after Mr. Dealer's death and during the 90 day window that the jury believed was permissible under the operating agreement. Um, but you're saying that the jury's verdict on that presupposes that the Parkers had validly tried to wind up Mr. Beeler's uh, interest. That's and what, I, what Why is that? It, it, I mean, if uh, they're finding a conclusion that, that you know they went forward, so now there are two members, doesn't really tell you too much about well, then what happened with respect to trying to you know terminate Mr. Beeler's interest? Did they make a valid proffer? You know, uh, proffer was the bank wrongful and refusing to accept it, and under the operating agreement, you know, those are all. Issues that I don't know that the jury directly answered. Yeah, the jury did address that question in, in the second, third interrogatory answer, in which they said the Parkers validly elected to continue the business. Well, now, but continuing the business yeah, is mean, different from wrapping up Mr. Well, Beeler's well, interest. I, I don't think you can divorce the fact that from 2003 through 2018, all of the income that the party stipulated those three properties generated. They awarded to the Parkers as the owners in their mind of the property and because they viewed us being owners of the company from, from which the properties were taken and presumably would be returned, I think, is what the jury believed. All right, Mr. Mr. Cornwall, um, I know we've taken you over your time. You asked for some time for rebuttal to address your cross appeal, and we'll allow you that time in rebuttal. Um, let's hear uh, from Mr. Grant on behalf of the appellees. Mr. Grant, you're still on uh, mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Robert Grant on behalf of the appellee and cross appellant. Um, I wanted to dive right in on Judge McLeese's line of uh, questioning right there, because I think that's the central issue on the Parker's appeal. Um, as, as counsel for the appellant said, um, they contend that the operating agreement gave them an option to purchase not the properties, but Mr. Beeler's membership interest in the properties. And as he says, that was a very favorable price. And the actual value of the membership interest was much greater than the strike price for the interest. And that gap between the strike price on the one hand and the value of the interest on the other is sort of where their damages claim lives. But they presented evidence to the jury, um, a, a number of different theories to try and recover um, what they claim their damages were. And one of the things that they said was that they had a deal with Mr. Beeler. First of all, they said that the operating agreement says that all members uh, including Mr. Beeler and the Parkers, all contributed the properties to the LLC based on some language in the operating agreement that's clearly contradicted by the land records, which show that Mr. Beeler was always the sole owner of these properties until he conveyed them by deed into the LLC. They also told the jury that they had a deal with Mr. Beeler to buy the properties. And the sole evidence on this point was Jay Parker's testimony. And this goes to the dead man statute issue, which is the subject um, was one of the points we raised in our cross appeal. I'll get to that later. But the, the argument was that they had a deal to buy these properties from Mr. Beeler, um, that they signed a promissory note, which was never produced, um, never shown to the jury, never produced in discovery, don't know where it is. Uh, they said that they play, paid $649 a month for some period of months, but the bank records that were produced showing that um, have, have, frankly, nothing to tie them to any particular transaction. This was a family that owned a lot of real estate in Washington uh, and was involved in a lot of transactions with each other. There was nothing in the bank records to show that this had anything to do with a payment um, for those properties. And Mr. Grant, I, I'm sorry, I, I may be mixing apples and oranges as you talk about the damages point, but I, I'm, I'm still not clear why the bank felt that they were entitled to the value of the LLC owned properties upon Mr. Beeler's passing, um, particularly in light of the jury's finding that the Parkers elected to continue the LLC and paragraph 13 of the operating agreement required um, 
you to transfer Mr. Beeler's interest in the LLC back to it? Well, uh, remember that that's the point that we got summary judgment on, Your Honor. So, in in so the operating agreement says that if this election does not occur, then the LLC is dissolved. Judge Ross's summary judgment order back in 2007 says the LLC is dissolved and should be wound up. That order is appealed, but there's never any stay pending appeal. And so, and this is what Judge Mott concluded in the, and the Parkers filed a separate lawsuit about this point, about the conduct that they said was the bank's bad conduct in connection with the dissolution and winding up of the LLC. And Judge Mott for the Superior Court concluded that because there was no stay and the order directed that the LLC be wound up, that the bank acted properly in reliance on the DC statute in standing in the shoes of Mr. Beeler and winding up the, um, the LLC. The well, Judge Mott's ruling, uh, Judge Mott did say something along those lines, but his ultimate ruling was, I'm dismissing this without prejudice, it's tied up in the other litigation. And so Judge Mott didn't actually uh, legally declare anybody's rights in connection with that, uh, that matter well, he, he dismissed it without prejudice, Your Honor. It was actually a, a summary judgment order. He, he granted summary judgment on that point. And the Parkers- I, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. I, I'm not sure I follow you. You're saying he, well, I thought he dismissed the matter without prejudice. Well, Judge Mott's ruling, Your Honor, comes um, while, this, while this case, the 2005 case is up on appeal. The Parkers never attempt to bring these claims into this case, the 2005 case, until 2017. By 20, by, that's when they filed their motion for leave to file a third amended complaint. Well, the, but at, at, the, dissolution at, the, the dissolution of the company happens in 2008. Well, so at what point can, during this time sequence did the bank um, take the properties? 2008. Well, and, and, and at what point um, in the time sequence, you have to remind me, was that, that was after the, Judge Ross, uh, that was after the Parkers had, Ms. Parker had uh, split her interest and therefore the two, there was, there was the re requisite number of two members to continue the LLC. Well, that was in dispute. And Judge Ross gave a summary judgment in 2007. The Parkers appealed. So, so I'm sorry, they had already split their interests. So there were two people, uh, the requisite number under paragraph 13 or paragraph 12 of the agreement to continue the LLC. Yet during that period where they had split the two people, I mean, split the, split the interest, declared their desire to continue the LLC, the bank took the properties and refused to return them to the now, uh, I guess, operating LLC. Well, Your Honor, respectfully, we disagree and still disagree about the um, authenticity and the effect of the January 2003 document, which is the purported transfer and election. What do you disagree on when you said the authenticity of it? Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, so Your Honor, um, there's you mean the, the validity of it or the authenticity? I mean, there is a document saying that they, uh, uh, so Ms. Parker sold half of her interest to Mr. Parker, right? Yes, Your Honor. Here's the first time that the bank hears anything from the, from the Parkers about electing to continue the LLC is a letter from a lawyer named Roy Niedermeyer who represents both Nancy and Jay Parker. He writes in October, 2013, some nine months after Mr. Beeler's death and well outside the 90 day window. He sends a letter that Mr. Parker testified he reviewed before it was sent. Um, and Mr. Niedermeyer sends a letter to the bank's counsel at the time saying, Nancy Parker as the sole surviving member of the LLC intends to exercise her right under the operating agreement to purchase Mr. Beeler's interest. Then he sends another letter and Mr. Parker testifies at trial that he saw this letter before it went out. And that's in November. 
And Mr. Niedermeyer says, as I indicated in my uh, October letter, Mrs. Parker as the sole surviving member elected to continue the LLC. And there's a whole series of correspondence that Jay Parker sees before it's uh, sent in which the sole reference is to Nancy Parker as a surviving member and Nancy Parker's election in October outside the window to continue the LLC. Okay, I mean, counsel, the, the, the jury's decided all this. And then they also heard some testimony apparently from Jay Parker saying that he went in person to a bank branch and, and declared this election within the 90 day time period, right? So the jury heard that and the jury also heard that the person that he allegedly spoke with did not even work for the bank at the time he supported. Okay, so he got so he got the name wrong. I mean, that's that's a decision that the jury gets to make. Well, uh, we're, for purposes of this appeal, Your Honor, we're not challenging the authenticity of the document. Okay. What we are challenging is that it doesn't say what the Parkers claim that it says. And our position is that no reasonable juror looking at this document can conclude that this is an election by Jay Parker to continue the Hartford E. Beeler LLC. It just doesn't say that, Your Honor. He's very careful um, to have Nancy Parker sign as the sole remaining member of HEB LLC. He signed well, I, I, don't know, I don't know how careful he was. I mean, my, my memory is that the letter, and I don't have it in front of me, so you'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, was that the letter was, in addition to that, express, explicitly referenced them both as members of the LLC, that the letter, it, it used the words members. Am I, am I wrong? It, what it says is that- Not Nancy at that point. Transfers but. her interest to Jay, transfers half of her interest to Jay Parker, and then they sign, and Nancy is the only person who signs as a member of the HEB LLC. And then Mr. Parker and Mrs. Parker signed as remaining members of the other family LLCs. So there is no signature on this document by Mr. Parker. Does the, doc, does the election have to be in writing? I think the election has to be in writing and it has to be tendered to the personal representative of the estate of the deceased member. This whole argument- What in the operating agreement says either of those two things? Um, the operating agreement doesn't speak to that, Your Honor, but this notion that the um, the operating agreement says that the surviving members don't have to deal with the estate of a deceased member. This whole claim is that the Parkers had a deal with the estate of a deceased member. So the notion that they don't have to talk to the estate is, is simply silly. And well, actually, the, the, the provision in the operating agreement says they don't have to deal with uh, people who aren't members except as provided in the agreement. And so the agreement does require some wrapping up, you have to deal with the successor in order to wrap up the interests of the withdrawn, uh, um, what's referred to in the operating agreement as a withdrawn member. So uh, it's not that you don't have to deal at all. It's that you don't have to deal except as provided in the agreement. Um, but can I ask you, let me step back a minute. I understand you dispute a lot of this, but um, uh, take as a given that you, the jur you, you were working from the jury's verdict here that the Parker's lawfully elected to continue the LLC. Um, and so there was an ongoing LLC. Um, uh, take that as a given. Um, uh, can you explain how under the operating agreement, the bank's conduct is, thereafter could be viewed as lawful? Um, I understand you have an argument that you would have thought it was lawful because you had already gotten summary judgment in your favor to the contrary of the premise of my question. Um, so I got that, um, and I understand that there are various judicial decisions that might shed on that, but just in terms of walking through the operating agreement, take as a given that there was a valid election within the 90-day window uh, 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 so that the two Parkers were now running an LLC. If that, was, if that is true, can the bank lawfully have done what it did thereafter, or was the bank's conduct impermissible under the operating agreement? Well, the, the counterfactual, if there's an ongoing LLC, then there is no winding up, but that's not the situation. No, that's not. Well, I, yeah, winding up is imprecise. I, I, I was a little imprecise. Uh, um, winding up Mr. Uh, Beeler's interest. Your Honor, there's a court order that says wind up the LLC. I, I understand that your argument is that you know you might have had reason to think what you did was lawful, your client did. But my question is just under the operating agreement. 
assume that here's the situation. Mr. Beeler has passed away. The bank is, his, you know, is, is acting as personal representative. There is an ongoing LLC. Under that scenario, un, can you explain to me under the operating agreement how what the bank did was lawful under the operating agreement? That's my question. Well, Judge Mott's conclusion was that the bank- My question isn't about anything about Judge Mott. It really is just point me to the provisions in the operating agreement that would make what the bank did lawful under the premise that Mr. Beeler had died, the bank was his successor personal, you know, personal representative, and there is a valid ongoing uh, LLC with the two Parkers as the members. That's my question. Can you tell me under the operating agreement on what theory the bank could have done what it did under the operating agreement? Well, if there's an ongoing LLC, then there's no winding up. If the Parkers didn't allow- My question, fair enough, but my question is what the bank did, so fair, there's no winding up. What the bank did was it then sold the prop, purported to be the manager and sold the property. Is that lawful under the operating agreement under the, 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 the with the premises I gave you? Yes, your honor. The DC under what code, provisions? The DC code permits the estate of a de deceased member to exercise the rights of that member, including in winding Unless up. the operating agreement pro provides otherwise. Right, and the operating agreement does not provide otherwise here unless you say as a premise of the question that there was an election. But at the time that we wound up, there was no election according to an unstayed judgment of the superior court. Well, so it's a premise of your answer. Again, you keep wrapping back into you could what you could have thought what you did was lawful. That's a big part of your uh, response. And I understand that, but I'm not sure I uh, understand the legal support for your view. If I win in the trial court and uh, I know that that judgment is on appeal, and so I might end up losing. And I, you know, on the theory that I won under, I can do various other things thereafter, and I do them. Is it your view that if I end up losing on appeal, then I have like absolute immunity, so that no one can impose damages on me for what I do thereafter, um, because nobody stayed the judgment, and uh, you know, so I'm kind of immune from any further damages if I end up being wrong and act on you know, my temporary victory, if, if you think that's a correct view of the law, immunity. let me just finish the question. If you think that's the right view of the law, can you point me to any authority that supports that idea? It's not that there's immunity, Your Honor. It's that if a, an appellant wants a stay, they have to come in and ask for a stay and they have to post a bond. And if there isn't any stay, then the, the prevailing party can carry out the terms of the judgment. Right, but you're saying with no risk that if they end up losing on appeal, that any damages that what they ultimately, you know, the Court of Appeals determined was unlawful conduct, they're just free from any liability unless there is a stay that prevents them from taking the actions in question. I'm just asking, what is there is there law for that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure that, intuitively that seems right to me. I'm not saying that there's immunity, Your Honor. What I'm saying is the Parkers filed suit on this. They filed a whole separate lawsuit in the Superior Court based on the bank's alleged bad conduct in connection with the dissolution and winding up. And that case was dismissed. And they never tried to bring those claims into this case, the 2005 case, until they sought leave to amend in 2017. And Judge Rankin appropriately said at that point, look, I'm not gonna allow you to amend at this point nine years after the bad conduct that you're talking about, which was the su subject of a whole separate lawsuit, I'm not going to allow you to fold those in. You waited too long. So it's not that they never could have um, uh, sought redress for what they claim was bad conduct. It's just that they did. And Why then, did, uh, did you say 2017? I thought they filed a second amended complaint in 2012 that tried to wrap these in. The, the second amended complaint does not talk about post um, judgment conduct by the bank. Well, I'm looking at paragraph 25 of it that said Bank of America breached its fiduciary duty when it uh, took it upon itself to dissolve the company and to transfer the property to itself as personal representative of the estate. But that claim is really just duplicative of the breach of conduct or breach of contract claim. That that's that's we're entitled to the value of the properties. Well, I mean, it may or may not be overlapping, but I am just addressing your argument that the uh, uh, your opponent unreasonably delayed in attempting to add to this litigation separate, maybe overlapping uh, claims of uh, you know uh, uh, legal claims 
uh, it, uh, it looks to me as though they were trying to add them uh, in 2012. Well, Your Honor, they did, they did litigate, they made the argument that the banks should not have uh, dissolved it. And they presented the jury uh, with evidence about the value of the properties. That's what they said was the measure of their damages. But they also presented the jury with this idea that they were paying in. And the jury could have believed that there was such a deal, but not believed that the Parkers actually performed that deal. And so I, I get that point for sure. Your opponents are in response to your argument, the abstract ver version of which is they've already had a shot at trying under the breach of contract claim, the argument that they suffer damages with respect to the uh, bank's taking of the assets of the uh, 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 LLC. And the jury obviously didn't believe them. I, 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 that's the, the form of that argument. I think their response is Yes, but we didn't have a fair opportunity to litigate that claim because the trial court incorrectly said that we weren't allowed to allege and try to prove the illegality of the bank's conduct in post 2000, you know, in, in, in taking those steps. Um, what's your response to their argument that they really never, you know, they had to litigate that with, you know, one and a half hands tied behind their back because of the trial court's incorrect ruling that that couldn't be part of their theory in front of the jury? Well, the jury was aware that the properties were no longer in the LLC. There's this theme in the Parker's appeal that the jury must have thought that the properties were still in the LLC. But the stipulations that they point to both refer to uh, the stipulation as to income and as to the value of the properties, both refer to the properties as having been previously held by the LLC. That's at page 506 of the appendix um, and, and in the... Um, in the transcript um, when Mr. Uh, when appellant's counsel read the stipulations to the jury. So, so I'm not sure if the argument is that the- I'm sorry, can I, I'm just looking at the stipulation right now and I, I don't see the word previous, the words previously held. So is that your gloss or are you, uh, are, 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 do you think you're quoting? And if so, can you show me where the, uh, uh, I guess in, 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 par in, in, in paragraph two, it says the properties previously held when they're talking about the distribution. LLC. I and see. Then That's in the context of, uh, yeah, and in four. Previously held had a market value. Got it. Right. Thank you. I didn't originally see them, but now I do. Thank you. Sure. So, so our position is that, that they had their shot at arguing all this stuff. If the breach of fiduciary duty claim is in the second amended complaint and they didn't present separate evidence on that, that's not, that's not because of Judge Rankin's ruling about it. Um, so so you know, the bank's position is um, that all litigation needs to come to an end. They have not articulated any basis for, for contending that the jury made a, a mistake. The jury was free to look at the permutations of evidence that were presented to it, believe all, some, or none of it, and it made its finding. Um, Mr. Grant, I'm sorry. Yes, Your Honor. Um, you say that the litigation should come to an end. I, I, there's still so many questions in this uh, case, but I'm still not sure I clearly understand your earlier response to my question, and I think to Judge McLeese's follow-up question about how um, you interpret the DC code provision 29-1039 to have essentially overridden um, paragraph 15-AI and paragraph 12-C of the agreement, which seems to indicate that the bank was not entitled to step into the shoes of Mr. Beeler. I mean, is there some additional case support or was there a different provision of the agreement that you think uh, gave the bank that authority? I, I, I apologize if I missed that in your earlier response, but I'm not clear on what your answer to that is. Well, Your Honor, our position is that there isn't a provision of the operating agreement which, um, which trumps the language of the statute. The statute is, there, is there a case law that you could point us to that interprets the statute in that way? that would further support your argument that, that, that it overrid the agreement? 
It's not our position that the case law overrides the agreement, Your Honor. It's that there's nothing in the operating agreement that overrides the statute. No, my, my question was whether there was case law that supports your interpretation of the statute and that gave you the authority, or that gave the bank the authority to do that. Um, Your Honor, we haven't briefed that because, um, um, frankly, I didn't anticipate that that would be um, uh, an issue that the court was deciding. Judge Mott decided this um, and, and um, in our view, it's, it's settled. Um, I'm sorry, what well, you think it's settled by Judge Mott's order dismissing a case without prejudice? Yes, Your Honor. And the fact that then the Parkers did not, um, did not, what they're really arguing is, is the court's ear earlier question about capital accounts. Now, this isn't, um, they're saying that even if they're, uh, if the, um, LLC should have been wound up, um, they were entitled to litigate the value of their capital accounts. And they didn't attempt to bring the capital accounts issue into the case until the proposed third amended complaint in 2017, which is now nine years at, at the time was nine years after the acts that they were complaining of. So even if the dismissal was without prejudice, they had a limitations problem. All right, Mr. Grant, we've gone way over Chief, your time. Chief, can I, ask, yes, yes, can I ask him one question? This is a, a simple kind of yes or no, I think, uh, kind of in line with your uh, theme that this litigation should wrap up. Uh, your, the appellant asked for either a remand for uh, trial on damages or either just that we say the trial court should have amended the judgment to reflect the value of the properties by an additional five point whatever million dollars. <clears throat> um, I don't recall if you stated a preference as between those two, if it comes down to it, which is your preference? Well, our position, Your Honor, and I think we articulated this in the brief is that if there is a new trial, um, it should be remanded on, on liability as well, because if I, I, I appreciate that, counsel, and I, I suppose my question is just more targeted. You know, assuming that's not happening, uh, which of the two, uh, a remand for a trial on damages or a remand to enter judgment for the additional value of the properties? Do you think is appropriate? Well, we certainly don't believe it's appropriate to remand to to just pick the value of of the properties because. As Judge McLeese uh, was indicating earlier in his line of questioning, there are any number of different routes that the jury could have gone to to quantify the gap between the strike price and the value of the membership interest. Understood. Thank you. What we think a plausible explanation for what the jury did do, in fact, is to say that the Parkers didn't perform the deal that they said that they had and therefore weren't entitled to the full value of the properties. Um, so, so if it goes back, it should go back on remand for a new trial, not for, um, the, the Parkers don't wanna say that they think it was a compromise verdict because they don't wanna have a new trial on liability, but the allegation or the argument essentially is you can't understand what the jury did here unless they were trying to compromise. Okay, thank you, Mr. No Grant. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your argument. You'll have a few minutes for a uh, rebuttal as well. Well, no, I guess you, you will on the uh, cross claim. This is a cross appeal. This is where we always uh, get a little uh, off the usual order of argument when we have the cross appeals. Uh, Mr. Cornwall? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Very quickly. Um, the bank didn't just not contest the authenticity of the resolution that the Parkers executed. They, they didn't even object to the admissibility of it. The jury heard all of uh, counsel's arguments and rejected them. That was what the trial was all about. Um, this suggestion that we didn't amend the pleadings to add an action for conversion and accounting um, it is just absolutely false. We did. As soon as the case was back in the trial court, we amended the pleading to add claims um, for an account. But your, your brief in this court doesn't really argue the merits of, of 
Judge Mott's order dismissing uh, the conversion claim. Um, how can we reach that uh, decision here when your brief didn't really touch on it? Um, uh, we absolutely did brief that. That's one of the orders on appeal is Judge Mott's summary judgment order. And we specifically say we were prejudiced by the dismissal of the conversion claim. Right. You didn't, I said you didn't really argue extensively brief this issue here. I, I would agree with you with respect to how we argued other things. Yes, Your Honor. I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, two, uh, two other points. The bank says that we were supposed to have anticipated, <coughs> from our view, they would undertake what is illegal conduct from our perspective. That is, convert. Out of the LLC, dissolve the company. There was no purpose in anticipating that the bank would act in the manner that it did and take the property. And there was no obligation to seek a stay to keep them from doing that, which the law doesn't allow them to do. Um, finally, if we end the case as the bank suggests, and this hasn't been mentioned, so I think this the panel must hear this, the bank will end up with in excess of $5 million worth of property held by this LLC without paying as much as a nickel for the 50% interest they stipulate that Ms. Parker had. And the jury said Ms. Parker had the right to 100% interest in the LLC. So uh, at a minimum, there's got to be a new trial on damages. The bank can't steal the property and then pay nothing. They executed no consideration deeds. They acknowledge and admit they didn't pay anything. And this notion that paragraph 15B of the operating agreement allowed them to do this is just wrong. It required an accounting of the capital accounts of the, the members if there was not a continuation of the business. That should have been done by the member, Ms. Parker, and then a dissolution and distribution of the assets once liquidated under paragraph 15B. Thank you for your patience. All right, thank you, Mr. Cornwell. Um, Mr. Grant? a brief opportunity to respond to that. You're, you're still muted. You're still muted, Mr. Grant. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just very briefly on the accounting issue. In the second amended complaint, the claim for an accounting is an accounting of the income and expenses relating to the properties. So that's the claim for an accounting that we're talking about here. And that was resolved in the 2018 trial by stipulation. So we didn't talk about an accounting. The accounting that Mr. Cornwell is talking about now is accounting, an accounting of the capital accounts. That's what they tried to add in the um, motion for leave to amend and file a third amended complaint. And that's what Judge Rankin said, no, you already filed a separate lawsuit about this. Judge Mott dismissed it. We're not going to expand the scope of this case to permit that. So that's. Can I ask you? I'm looking at the second amended complaint and the accounting, and it says in paragraph 39, as a result of the actions and inactions of BOA set forth more fully herein, plaintiffs have been tried, deprived of the ability to review and inspect the books of account of the company and are unable to determine the exact amount of their losses. I, I didn't see a limitation there that was, we're only trying to figure out what the value of the assets of the LLC uh, uh, are. So is that somewhere else in the, the complaint or am I missing something? It, it's in the wherefore clause, your honor. They asked for an accounting of the income and expenses related to the properties. In other words, what did the Barrick company take in as rents and what did it pay out for expenses? So it's not an accounting of the capital accounts in the second amended complaint. All right, um, uh, you mentioned the, the um, I'm sorry, D Judge McLeese, were you gonna- No, no, uh, go ahead, sorry. Um, this is on a slightly different subject that you mentioned briefly in your argument and in your brief about the dead man statute. And if we were to remand for a new trial, I guess what authority would it there be for us to rule prospectively, prospectively on the dead man statute and whether the court should limit testimony on that basis? So, Your Honor, the court I think has um, authority to address issues that are likely to come up on remand. Um, the dead man statute, section 14 302, is intended to prevent precisely the kind of testimony that Mr. Parker. Uh, 
gave at trial where there's no documentation, no corroborating evidence either on this supposed deal that the Parkers had uh, to buy the properties or on the conception of what members were and whether the agreement permitted Nancy Parker to add a member post-death. Why do you say there is no corroborating evidence? I know you point out the limitations of this corroborating evidence, but according to the, the testimony of Ms. Parker, you know, her version is that there was this agreement and that she was making payments to, to uh, Mr. Beeler in the amount of $649 uh, uh, for a extended period of time. And there is corroboration of that not definitive corroboration. You point out its limitations for sure, but there, you know, it's not just her word. She comes in and says, and here I can show you something that is consistent with and operates to support my testimony. Here is, you know, the, the bank record that shows this periodic payment for, for many months. And, and for to be sure, it's not definitive corroboration because as you point out, there's no docu the documents don't reflect what the payments went to and you suggest there are alternate explanations. But why do you say there's no corroborating evidence? It seems to me that there is some, and you've pointed out some of the limits of that corroborating evidence. Um, and if you agree that that is at least some corroborating evidence, if you know limited, uh, then which side of the dead man statute do you think this case would fall on? Your Honor, they, Mr. Parker testified that there was a promissory note. They never produced the note. Um, if Mr. Parker, if the theory of the deal was correct, that um, part of what they were doing was assigning the income that they were entitled to, to Mr. Beeler in satisfaction of this obligation, um, then that still would have been taxable income to them. Um, the, the LLC would have issued a K-1 allocating the income to them they would have had to report that on their own personal tax returns as something that they receive, even if they didn't physically receive a check, it was money that went in satisfaction of an obligation of theirs. There were no tax records produced that showed this. The only thing that they had was these bank records that show the transfers for some number of months of $649. And in our brief, we analogize this to the statute of frauds a memorandum sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds is not just any reference to some transaction. It's gotta be specific enough to show what the terms of the transaction are. And so we think by analogy, for evidence to be sufficient to corroborate testimony for purposes of the dead man statute, it's at least gotta show not just that there was some transaction, but what the transaction was to corroborate the testimony about what the transaction was, the documentation should also show what it was. Otherwise, you just have a live uh, living witness coming in and saying, this is what the dead man and I agreed to. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grant. Um, thank you, Ron. Um, I, I want to thank both parties for your briefs and your arguments uh, today and the cases submitted. Um, as you exit our virtual courtroom, we'll uh, prepare to call our next case. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> All right, uh, good morning, Mr. Resnikoff. All right, uh, um, I think Mr. Moore's audio is still connecting. Uh, do, do you have me, Don Reznikoff? Yes, good morning, Mr. Reznikoff. We can see you and hear you, and we're okay. just uh, waiting for Mr. Um, uh, Moore to connect his audio and uh, video. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
All right, um, Mr. Moore, are you able to hear us? All right, as we um, transition to this new virtual uh, video oral argument um, platform um, in light of the COVID-19 um, health concerns, we may experience some technical glitches from time to time. So your patience is appreciated. Um, Mr. Moore, are you able to hear us? It looks like his audio is still connecting. Mr. Moore, are you able to hear us? Okay, Mr. Moore, can you hear us now? Yes, I apologize, Your Honor. Um, my IT uh, assistance were, uh, had tested this yesterday and determined that the telephone audio system worked better than the computer system. So it took a few seconds, a minute or two, to hook up the telephone along with the uh, video feed that was already in place. Well, no problem. Um, um, I guess we, we all are um, practicing our patience as we deal with this, the many new technological changes um, in, in some of our court proceedings, including this video remote oral argument. So uh, good morning. Uh, this is our third case this morning um, in the matter of Ethio Inc. et al. versus Capital Petroleum Group, LLC, and Landmark Petroleum Suppliers, LLC, and Terefe uh, Burhanu et al. Um, Council, are you ready to proceed? Uh, yes, I am, Your Honor, thank you. Um, uh, of course, I'm Don Reznikoff. I'm counsel for the tenant appellant here. And I guess before I uh, get started with the uh, argument, I should reserve uh, five minutes for a rebuttal. Um, I, I assume I'm going to get a fair number of questions uh, today and so uh, to try to use my time efficiently, I wanna briefly outline a few points that I wanna make sure to touch on. Uh, I'll then come back to them in a little more detail. One is uh, characterizing the contract issue here. Um, the, uh, the contract issue that I wanna focus on for this appeal and try to focus on for the trial court is whether or not there was an agreement between the appellant here, the landlord, Mr. Mamo's companies, and my, and my client. And uh, the main argument there, as I'll come back to, is that the landlord stated those agreements in uh, writing, in letters, emails, uh, and, such, and other documents in such a way that met the requirements of the statute of frauds and is enforceable. And, uh, and, and that's the focus. Um, other points I want to touch uh, on. Count, counsel, can you just, sure. you know, uh, can you just specify when you say the landlord, are you talking about Landmark or are you talking about Mr. Yes. Ewing? Okay. A landmark. The, the defendant is Landmark. Uh, Ku Yuen is, is not a, a party to the case. I know. He, he was just a landlord at one point, which is why I wanted clarification. As yes, to... that's, that, that's correct. But the other, other points I want to uh, touch on that are uh, maybe simpler uh, before coming back to the, the contract is that there was a lease requirement in the written uh, uh, lease involving Mr. Ewan that required uh, tenant consent to an assignment and that that be in writing. And there was no written consent. The tenant's position is that there was no uh, waiver of that consent. And the fact is that the court below did not enter any finding on that. And, and when requested on remand to enter a finding, the the judge declined. But uh, for you know, roughly five years or so before any litigation was undertaken, 
Uh, you were aware of the assertion of an assignment. You were aware that Landmark was treating it as an assignment and, and never lodged an objection. Is that right? Uh, I, I would not agree with that characterization. I think that Mr. Where, when did when and what can you point me to? At which point did you lodge an objection? Well, I think I think that it's not until Mr. Bahanu hired an, an attorney that he had uh, uh, you know lawyer-like arguments back and forth with the landlord. And that was uh, Harry Storm. I believe that uh, uh, engagement didn't occur until 2014. I came in uh, a year or so later, and it's, it is part of this litigation. It's true. Could I ask you about the consistency between the two points you've made so far? Sure. The first point seems to be that you entered into a contract uh, with uh, Landmark. And the second seems to be that Landmark is sort of, with respect to one of the two gas stations where there was the written assignment requirement that landmark is kind of a stranger to this whole situation Th those seem to be somewhat uh, at cross purposes those two points well i th i think it is it, it, it's a fair point in general that, that we have two alternative arguments and they are are in the alternative the uh oral agreement that was uh confirmed by landmark in in uh, uh 2013 is an alternative to the uh, written uh, contracts that were entered into by Ku Yuan in 2001 and 2003, and were subject it, pretty clearly to an ovation in 2009. So there are, alter, there are alternate uh, arguments, and, and I, I think that does create the potential for confusion between them. Uh, part of the oral agreement that you're alleging was entered into in 2009. Uh, was that it was terminable at the option of the landlord, Mr. Ewan at that time, and ultimately Landmark, uh, upon 30 days notice. Isn't that right? I think that's wrong. I think that the, uh, with due respect, that the, uh, the, the terms and conditions uh, of that arrangement are as set out by the landlord, the appellant here, in the letter of 2013. It does not say that it was terminable. Well, it says quite the contrary. The language that's, that's in that letter said, says that the... Uh, the I'm, I'm sorry, are you talking about the 2013, the January 2013 termination letter? Yes, exactly. Okay. That, it's, that it says that the, it, 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 it states the, the pre-existing agreement, that the, uh, the flat fee agreement is coextensive with the term of the lease. Mr. Co Mr. Ristenkopf, if I could uh, stop you just for a minute, just to sure. make sure, you know, a lot of our questions, as you hear from Judge Steele and others, are are trying to clarify the sequencing here. And you, they, there have been a couple of landlords, a couple of tenants, a couple of yes. leases, a couple of contracts. Yes. This started uh, with Mr. Burhanu as the tenant and Mr. Yuen as the original um, landlord. Who there were two leases. The lease for the physical space of the gas station and the rent, and then the second lease for fuel agreements. Uh, so, so Mr. Bahanu was to purchase fuel uh, and sell it on behalf of Mr. Yuan, and that was the fuel lease originally, and then pay rent for the use of the uh, gas station premises. Um, so we had two written leases. That's correct. Uh, those, that, that was later as everyone uh, uh, seems to agree, an oral, amendment that changed the, 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 the relationship between the parties where um, and then Mr. Yuan to help out Mr. Bahanu and avoid Mr. Bahanu who was having difficulty making payments for both the fuel lease and the premises lease, Mr. Yuan agreed to pay Mr. Bahanu a flat fee and, and, and then take the profits from the gasoline that was sold. Mr. Yuan then sells the property to um, um, a new landlord, um, Ethio, uh, I'm sorry, Landmark Petroleum, correct? That is all correct, although I'm sure. And, uh, and then, and so, so then, you know, they operate sort of like they had been operating under the orally modified agreement between Burhanu and UN. But now we have Mr. Mon Mamo with Landmark Petroleum who has his own petroleum co connection. So he doesn't want to continue under the same term. So, so where could you just be more specific as to 
at what point you enter and which agreements you're talking about uh, so that well, we're all on the same page. Uh, I, I can try. I can say, by the way, that uh, Mr. Brahana would, would testify that he thought he was doing Mr. Yuen a favor, but that's uh, neither here nor there. The main point is that the characterization of the agreement between Mr. Yuen and uh, my, my client, uh, Jeff Brahana, is stated by the defendant in the 2013 letter. And that, in my, in, in, we're arguing, is the correct characterization of the UN uh, agreement. Which is that, what? That it was orally modified. That it was orally modified, but that the oral modification is as stated in that writing and not as testified to by Mr. Mamo or Mr. UN. The, the writing says flat out that the flat fee agreement is coextensive in time with the term of the lease, referring to the old uh, written lease. Which lease? Which part of it? The fuel lease or the, the rental lease? Because they're two, aren't they two, weren't they essentially two original agreements? Um, yes, I would say, uh, I, I actually, I think that's ambiguous, but I'm not sure it makes any difference. It's either one or the other. It's coextensive with the lease terms, one or the other. It is not a uh, term that's inconsistent with the idea that Mr. Yuan testified to, Mr. Mao testified to, that it was a terminable at, at will. But, uh, but counsel, I mean, the letter you're, so I mean, I, I appreciate your point on the consignment flat fee agreement uh, that this 2013 termination letter purports to carry that on forward but it also purports to terminate uh, the rent abatement agreement, right? That's true. Um, so is, is what, so just so I understand what position you're staking out, is the position you're staking out that, you know, only the assignment and uh, flat fee agreement was carried forward, but that this letter really did effectively terminate the rent abatement. And so that all you're seeking is an offset of their damages award for the, Five thousand and three thousand dollars a month that they should have been remitting to you. Um, the, Sorry, that was a lot. No, no, it, 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 it actually is a pretty, pretty crucial, because I think it, it, it's a, a subject of confusion that there is the first the written set of agreements, and then we move on to what is an alternate basis, uh, or an alternate argument that the substitute agreement. Uh, from A to Z, fuel supply and and lease uh, real estate lease substitute is this flat flat fee agreement. So I think the the argument is that uh, in 2013, the the landlord stated the terms and conditions uh, of the existing oral consignment you know uh, commission agreement in such a way as to meet the requirements of the statute of frauds. And, and we can rely on that. When we go to the abatement story, the abatement story is based on the assumption that the old paper uh, lease is still uh, in effect. And uh, the, th the theory there is uh, of the landlord is that if, if the paper lease is still in effect, what Mr. Bahano had to do is to make an argument to the landlord to abate the, the to continue to abate the rent under the old lease. But our argument is that if you, if you take uh, as, as true the, the writing that's in the letter of 2013, the, the new agreement is uh, one that meets the statute of frauds, uh, rec reciting the, the new, uh, the, the, the revised consignment commission agreement. I hope I've asked. Answered. Well, I, I'm not sure. And let me try to follow up. I, uh, uh, I think the question was about uh, what's your view about uh, what this letter reflects or what the state of the, the correct legal understanding of the relations between the parties was about the lease? I know you say it was an assumption that the, the rent abatement uh, uh, agreement sort of could be terminated, but it's not so much an assumption. It was that there was conflicting testimony about that and the jury reached, a, you know, inferentially reached a conclusion or the fact finder reached a conclusion about it. And, um, so is it your view that um, sort of uh, the only reasonable 
conclusion a fact finder could reach about the status of the lease agreement, not the consignment, uh, you know, the, the, yeah. the consignment ag agreement, was that that rent abate uh, abatement can't be understood to have been temporary, um, but it has to have been in some way tied up with the consignment agreement so that it persists as long as the consignment agreement persists, because there was a, uh, you know, such a connection between the two of them that they can't, uh, no reasonable person could treat them as somehow severable and, uh, you know, one part of it temporary and the other lasting for as long as the written lease. Is that your well, argument or am I not understanding your point? Well, um, I, I think I understand your question and um, I'll try uh, to answer it. I think that the uh, four corners of the 2013 agreement, which we're relying on, are stated in the documents issued by the landlord, including the two letters that are exhibits one and two, a, uh, a, fo a follow-up uh, email, which stated the amounts, and that was exhibit uh, three, and, and there are other documents uh, that, that are relevant too. But that- But you, you, you that say those form. documents, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Wesley, sure. you, you say that, or I, at least I understood you to say that the, this 2013 letter sort of memorialized what you understood to be the oral modification to the lease and the fuel consignment agreement. Yes, exactly. And uh, in, in such a uh, way- in Such a way that what was then the agreement that you, under, that you gleaned from this 2013 writing? That, that the- uh, uh, just what said in the letters, that there was a, an arrangement for consignment of fuel, a payment of a flat fee commission in, a, in an agreed amount. Uh, and those are the really the, the, the main terms and conditions uh, of the agreement. How, how did parties. you, you also said that you thought it differed from what Mr. Yuen said was the yes. oral modification. In what respect? Well, Mr. Yuen and Mr. Mamo both testified that their understanding of the assignments that they entered into and the, that uh, of the oral agreement was that uh, number one, that, that the uh, fuel arrangement was terminable at will, 30 days notice, uh, and uh, and and that the only assignment was of the right to collect rent under this old uh, paper agreement and there was no obligation assigned to provide fuel either by consignment or by wholesale. Uh, and you disagree with that and and um, think that the assignment was per the written 2013 document as between the, right the 2013 letters mm -hmm. the, the uh, sup, supplemental uh, e email and, and there's assignment documents which are documents uh, eight and nine which are the assignment agreements between the uh, uh, mr ewan's companies and mr mamo's companies and those so, are relevant as well so where's the meeting of the minds between mr mamo and mr Brahanu? It, on what the agreement was. It's as stated in those letters. But well, what that letter says that the, the rent abatement agreement was terminable. Uh, and so if you're accepting the, what's all, everything that's in that letter, uh, then it seems as though you're stuck with uh, 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 the flat consignment agreement for the period of the lease, but you're required to make rent payments under the lease after the temporary rent abatement agreement is uh, terminated at the election of the, the new landlord. Well, I, I hope that's not so. Uh, the uh, uh, what I think is that if if a party states in a in a in a letter or a, do a document of any sort that uh, what the contract between the parties is, and then in the next sentences of the letter said, well, and by the way, I'm not going to follow it anymore. I'm re reneging oh, on it. Council, I mean, I'm, I'm really confused why you're putting so much emphasis on this January 2013 agreement, which says that the flat fee and consignment agreement replaces the motor fuel supply agreement. 
full stop. So yes. that, that's what it does. So, the, so this flat fee consignment agreement is in place of the motor fuel supply agreement. And then it says that agreement runs right alongside the lease agreement, which requires your client to pay a significant amount of uh, rent every, every month. Uh, so, you know, the logical conclusion of the argument you're making based on the January 2013 letter is the trial court was right to demand you pay all that rent. It should have offset it by the flat fee that you were supposed to get. But other than that, you're on the hook for it. Well, I mean, that, I, is, that is the understanding of the agreement that's that's elicited, that is stated in this January 2013 letter. Well, I think the 2000, that reads the 2013 letter as explicitly uh, uh, revive, um, uh, reviving the old uh, pay, paper lease uh, just because the, the, the terms are, are referred to there, but there's only there's only one lease council, and it's saying that this assignment and flat fee agreement is going to run concurrent with the lease, and then it it states the amount of monthly rent that they're now on the hook for. I mean, it's not really open to an alternative interpretation. That that the the interpretation that the paper lease continues to exist. Well, I think that's that's I, I I would respectfully disagree that that's what the letter and the assignment documents uh, state. Uh, Mr. Mr. Can I ask? I just want to clarify. I think we've lost video for Mr. Moore, and I just want to make sure Mr. Moore can still hear us. He he, he may be on mute, but Mr. Moore, if you could unmute to confirm whether or not you can still hear us, and that we haven't lost all uh, contact with you here. Mr. Moore, are you still uh, on the line here? Oh, it, your phone is muted, so we can't hear you. If you are there, could you unmute just to confirm that you, you can still hear the proceedings? Here he comes. Okay, Your Honor, I apologize. I, I don't know what happened, why the Zoom meeting went away. I don't know if we're having Wi-Fi problems, uh, but I have been able to hear the entire uh, argument by Mr. Resnikoff and the questions asked by the panel. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm that you were still uh, uh, with us and, and don't worry about the video at the moment as long as you can still hear us. Can I All ask right. you, yeah, thank uh, you, Mr. Resnikoff, about an aspect of, uh, it's wrapping it back around a little bit to your alternative argument that with respect to one of the two gas stations, you never considered to the assignment. And so that really Landmark is a stranger to this transaction. Yeah. I have a hard time following that in the following sense. If you weren't consenting to an assignment of the fuel supply contract from uh, power fuel power power fuel to Landmark, then in your view, how, 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 I mean, you, your client, how was your client accepting uh, gas from Landmark and selling it? Because wouldn't have that been a breach unless it, that Unless Landmark was assuming the rights and duties under power fuel, didn't the earlier power fuel, uh, uh, so the, 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 the uh, fuel supply agreement require you to deal exclusively with power, uh, power fuel? So it seems like your course of conduct has to reflect, your client's course of conduct has to have reflected an acceptance of the assignment of Landmark standing in for power fuel or else your, con your client's conduct was completely illegal under the earlier power, uh, power I keep saying power, fuel supply agreement. Well, um, I think I understand your point, but in, in fairness, Mr. Mr. Grahanu, um, uh had a contentious relationship uh, with Landmark from the start and uh, was not happy. He's not a lawyer. He doesn't, uh, to, to say that he entered into a, a, a knowing and purposeful waiver because he, he, he didn't pick up these nuances that he was previously selling power fuel, and now he would be accepting uh, Exxon Mobil, and that was sort of inconsistent. I, I don't think that's quite, quite. It's, it, uh, it's, it's, it's not such a nuance, Council. He is remitting all the proceeds from gas sales to Landmark for years before you raise this argument. Well, that that that's true, but I it, I'm not sure why that connects up to his, his knowing and purposeful waiver of his mm -hmm. rights. Mr. Uh, Resnikov, you, you also raise some, some other arguments. Um, you argue that um, un unconscionability 
Is that correct? As a means of correct. voiding the existing, which is usually a, a means of avo avoiding the voiding the existing contract. So there seems to be some tension between an unconscionability argument saying you want to void these agreements and then your breach of contract arguments saying that the agreement is there, but MAMO just breached it. Well, I, I think I understand that. I think that I would point to the fact that between the years 2013, March of 2013, straight through till uh, 2019, that there, the practice of the, Mr. Mamo's company was to consign gasoline to my clients and expect them to, to uh, manage the, the stations and sell the gasoline and then remit all the proceeds back to the Mamo company, at which time they provide, the Mamo company provided zero compensation to, to uh, my client. And, and that the reason that happened was a part of a pressure uh, campaign to force Mr. Bahanu to, to accept a new and unacceptable offer. And I think during that period, that there was no, con there, there, in effect, there was no contract being followed. And so there needs, and the behavior in, in pressuring Mr. Bahanu, our, our, our contention is, uh, was unconscionable. No, you, the, pr the pressuring, I mean, Ms. Landmark or Mr. Mamu had his own fuel supply connections that were different from Mr. UN, the, the, the pr prior landlord who assigned his rights to, um, to Mamu. So, so what do you point to um, in any of these oral or written agreements as you understand them to, to mean that Mr. Mamo could not use his own fuel connection to, to consign to the shop and get his own profits back? I don't think we have a contention that's based on uh, uh, stopping Mr. Mamo from using whatever fuel supply he wanted. I think it, as, as, as you probably well know, is that the gasoline comes from uh, uh, fuel supply terminals uh, undifferentiated as the brand and the brand designation is really just a matter of additives that, that are put in in the tank as, as the delivery occurs. So I, I don't think we have a point that Mr. Mama was not allowed to switch brands. But your point was what, that he couldn't stop making the flat rate payments to yeah. to Mr. Berhanu? Yes, that, that he needed, that the contention is that as a matter of contract law, that <coughs> that, that Mr. Mama was bound by the contents of the letter to continue to consign gasoline and, and, and pay a flat fee uh, commission on it. Okay. All right, um, let's hear from Mr. Moore. Good morning, uh, panel. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. I don't think I have a, a very much to argue here uh, because Mr. Reznikoff, I think, made the best argument when he referred to the two letters. And just for the record, uh, let's be clear, there are two properties here which I have shortened to the 12th Street property, and the other one is the South Capitol Street property. There was uh, a land lease uh, for each of those properties, and when Mr. Yoon's company uh, entered into those agreements, his companies uh, were some form of the name Power Fuels at the lead, there were also fuel wholesale fuel supply agreements. And to go a little bit further, uh, I think uh, eight, uh, seven, I think the uh, seven or eight years later in 2009, Mr. Yoon and Mr. Bahanu had a meeting to try to resolve Mr. Uh, Bahanu's financial difficulties. He wasn't making any profit under the wholesale agreement. And the important part here was that Mr. Uh, Mr. Brahanu 
after that meeting, during that meeting and afterwards, gladly accepted a change to the consignment arrangement. Along, which, alongside a rent abatement council. Uh, correct, a, a flat. I'm sorry, uh, that was a temporary, yes, a temporary abatement. No, no, I mean, um, it's, they, they it, all started at the same time. They are a consideration for one another. What Mr. Yuen testifies to is that the rent abatement was meant to be an exchange for this new fuel assignment, uh, this assignment flat fee arrangement. And he said that the assignment flat fee arrangement, the consignment flat fee arrangement, was going to roughly approximate what he otherwise would have taken in in rent. He said it would be a little bit less. It was a little bit of a hardship on him. But it was all a package deal when it came to that oral revision. And then in 2013, your client purports to cancel half of that deal, but keep the part that's good for you. We did, that was not the deal that anybody testified to. The key point of that deal that Mr. Yoon testified to was that the rent abatement was temporary and that it could be changed at any time upon 30 days notice. Council, I'm gonna point you to page 85 of the transcript. And this is Mr. Yuen's testimony. We own the gasoline and then we pay him a commission. And so we hope to make the profit that we would make instead somewhere close to the rent that we would have collected. This is him discussing the new arrangement that is replacing the lease plus uh, fuel supply agreement with a rent abatement plus uh, consignment and flat fee agreement. He's saying this is going to approximate my rent, but it's a little bit generous to Mr. Burhanu. That's, that's how it reads. I, can, I mean, that's page 85 of the transcript. I can point you to page 115 of the transcript where again, he says, uh, I have a temporary modification adjustment of the business where there's no rent and we control the gas. He talks about them collectively. Again, they all happen collectively. When there is a modification, they happen together. So explain to me why you think that those two things are severable. Because of Mr. Yoon's subsequent testimony that they were severable, that the, uh, that the rent abatement was temporary. Uh, he, he, ne he never says he never says that the other one is permanent counsel. I looked at the citation you gave for that and it doesn't say that. Then if we're going to go back to a whole Mr. I think if you go by Mr. Uh, Brahanu's testimony, he never wanted to go back to the wholesale fuel agreement. Yeah, he, wa he wanted to stick with the abatement and flat fee. I, I, I grant you that was a slight benefit to him over the lease plus fuel supply agreement. But when you take away the rent abatement and you leave in place the benefit to your client, which is the consignment and flat fee agreement, and then you don't even play the, pay the flat fee, what, what, is, what is that? What kind of contract is that? It's the contract that the parties had in place. They had written leases that were still in effect the leases were not amended in writing. There was nothing set forth. As they did, the, the leases didn't have to be amended in writing if there was an oral modification, which uh, everyone seems to agree that they, Mr. Yuen and Mr. Brahanu, orally modified the written uh, rent and uh, fuel consignment agreement. What we don't agree upon is the length of the rent abatement. And I got that, but can that, I ask you about the other half of it and the linkage? Because I, I'm coming at this uh, from another direction <laughs> and also a little confused. Can you clarify what you think uh, uh, the source is of your contractual relationship with Mr. Berhado and his entities about fuel supply? The source is what was conveyed by Mr. Mamo uh, the fuel no, 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 I don't, I, when I say source, you mean, do you think that you, I, mean, I, I, I want to know, you think that after Mr. Uh, uh, after uh, Landmark came into the picture, it entered into a new contractual fuel supply agreement with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Berhanu and his entities, uh, and then that's reflected in the, in, in the 2013 letter? No, that was not a new fuel supply agreement. Uh, what was assigned to Landmark was simply the I didn't leases. ask about assignment. I, I, I haven't, I, assignment is, uh, I was going to ask some questions about assignment, but right now I thought 
one thing you were suggesting is nothing was assigned about fuel supply. Well, let me, let me start even further back. Do you agree that there came a time when Landmark and Mr. Burhanu's entities had a contractual relationship with the other with, with each other about fuel supply? Landmark and Mr. You, I'm sorry, Mr. Burhanu? Yes. I believe what Landmark was exposed to- It is really was, a yes, no question, counsel. All I wanna know is, do you think they had a contractual relationship? Leave aside, let's talk, we'll talk in a minute about what, where it came from and what it was, but I just wanna know, do you think that, you, that Landmark and Mr. Burhanu and his entities had a contractual fuel supply relationship at some point? Yes. And where, do you, uh, that could either have come by assignment or it could have come because they then independently entered into an agreement. Which of those two things do you think it was? It would have to be by assignment and a course of dealing. Well, uh, I thought your client testified in the trial court found that the fuel supply contracts were not assigned at all. Your client, I know, testified that it was an important part of the financial arrangement, that it was not going to have to assume the fuel supply agreement. Um, so I'm, I was surprised by your suggestion that it might have come by assignment. It seemed contrary to your client's I, testimony and the trial honest, court's finding. I apologize. I erroneously lumped in the flat fee consignment with your question, with your term of a fuel supply agreement. Well, I'm, I'm using, no that to clarify, I'm using fuel supply in the broadest sense of the term. I mean, some kind of a contractual arrangement where Landmark agreed to provide and uh, Mr. Burhano and his, his entities agreed to sell uh, uh, fuel. Do you think there was a contractual no. agreement between those two entities to do that? No. That seems very puzzling in light of the 2013 letter sent by your client, which seems to presuppose such an agreement. Well, I'm answering your question the way you asked it, Your Honor. Um, under a consignment agreement, Mr. Ma Mr. Brahanu would not be a retailer. I didn't so use the word no retailer. I tried to avoid, uh, and maybe I failed, but I tried to say abstractly that Landmark was going to provide and Mr. Brahanu was going to sell. I tried to not use terms that would say whether it was being provided on consignment or being sold uh, directly to Mr. Burhanu for a profit. I'm not trying to distinguish among any of those. I just want to know, do you think there was some kind of a contract where Landmark had fuel, would provide it in you know one legal status or another to Mr. Burhanu, and Mr. Burhanu and his entities were contractually obliged to sell it and then to, in some way, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know in some way, whatever the agreement was by its terms, there would be compensation flowing one way or another. But at the highest level of abstraction, I just want to know if you think there was a contract, a contractual arrangement between the two of them to perform those abstract functions. Your Honor, I, I, under the statute, uh, statutory interpretation of retailer, I think the term sale. I'm not using, I, 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 I apologize to interrupt. I'm not using the word retailer. I just want to know, did you understand, but I, it, it's really, it's really a yes, no question. I mean, again, if you could ask me about one of my terms that I'm using and say what's what's confusing about it, that's fine too. But I, it's it's going to not be helpful to my trying to find out what I'd like to know for you to be injecting the term retailer into the discussion because I'm not I'm not asking a question about retailers or consignments or any of that. I'm just asking a question about was there a contract between? Let me put it this way: Was there a contract between the two of them relating to fuel? Yes. And where, where do you think, how did that contract arise? By assignment or by independent agreement? By assignment and course of dealing. And then, so then that got to my question of the, I thought your client said that it was an important part of the transaction with power fuel, that it wasn't accepting assignment of the fuel supply agreements. And I thought the trial court credited that testimony and found that there was no assignment. So that's why we need to uh, dis, uh, cut the linkage between the consignment flat fee agreement and the fuel supply agreement. The consignment agreement or flat, where flat fee commission was to be paid what is what was in place from 2009 to 2013 when Landmark became the owner or the lease uh, or whatever interest that Mr. Hume's companies had in the property. That those were the agreements that were assigned. There were the fuel supply agreements were no longer in effect, and those were not assigned. 
Did the trial court work? actually make a, a finding about that? I think part of the problem to me is it, it doesn't appear that the trial court decided that issue. That, that uh, number Honor, one, the there was a mo oral modification. Number two, the, the length of time of that oral modification. Um, and and, and w whether or not Mr. Yuen assigned um, the contract, including these oral modifications to both the fuel and the lease to Mr. Mamo. Um, is your assumption, it sounds like you're assuming or maybe you 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 read the record differently than I do, but I don't see that these findings, which I think needed to be made, were were ever clearly addressed below. So I don't see that there was a basis to say. I think it was an oral modification. I think it it, it um, transferred to Mr. Uh, Mamo, Mamo, um, but I, I and I guess I'm not clear on what your answer is to that in response to Judge McLeese's question. I have a very clear answer to that, Your Honor. Uh, March 16th, March 26, 2018 order, uh, as a result of the pretrial conference and the motions that both parties filed leading up to that pretrial conference, the Superior Court entered an order granting a motion in limine preventing Mr. Burhanu from presenting evidence at trial as to the issue of lost profits and there are all kinds of theories related to lost profits by Mr. Brahanu that he has espoused at various times uh, in the underlying case, but one of them was clearly lost profits under the fuel supply agreement. Mis uh, the Superior Court clearly found that the fuel supply agreements were rejected by Burhan Mr. Brahanu in favor of a consignment agreement and that there were no fuel supply agreement. But to... counsel, what the Superior Court didn't do is answer the question of whether or not that consignment flat fee arrangement was severable from the lease abatement. It didn't, it didn't say anything about that. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to treat them as severable when the testimony is that the rent abatement was offered in exchange to move to the consignment flat fee arrangement. As Mr. Yuen testified repeatedly, that would have approximated the amount he would have brought in in rent, the additional benefit to him. So I take your point that there is an oral modification changing the fuel supply agreement to a consignment and flat fee arrangement. I take your point that it was a sign. Where we depart is how on earth you think you can stop the rent abatement and keep that arrangement going. Like where, where, was, where is there, I mean, there's clearly no meeting of the minds on that. There's also no basis to assert that one was severable from the other, from what I can tell. But if you think there is, I'd love to hear it. Based on the totality of the testimony, if you just listen to Mr. You, Mr. Brahanu's testimony throughout as to what was changed about the lease and what agreements there were, uh, the Superior Court found that Mr. Uh, Mr. Brahanu never followed up to try to confirm the agreement that he thought he had or to uh, enlist the terms he thought he had. Uh, I don't have the transcript yeah, he, in front he, he of me. He made it very I, clear. I mean, here's, here's what's happening, counsel. I mean, Mr. Brahanu makes clear that he thinks the entire thing, the entire oral modification of the fuel supply agreement and the lease abatement, that's all carrying forward. Uh, your client thinks well, only the part that's good for us is carrying forward, but the lease abatement, the rent abatement is going away. Um, so the totality of the circumstances, what they show me is you've got two parties that are at total odds about how they interpret their agreement. Uh, one of them makes a little bit of sense that they would continue the thing they had done for the last three years. The other one where your client gets the entire benefit of the new fuel supply agreement, and that I'm saying in, that relates also to the consignment flat fee arrangement, but none of the rent abatement that he gave in exchange for that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So if you want to explain why that would be sensible, I am open to hearing it. Because Mr. Yoon's testimony was the only thing, the rent abatement was only temporary. There was no exchange of Acc the- Council, according to Mr. Yoon, everything was temporary. It all went together. He says on page 134, all this is temporary. 
He says, again, I mean, I don't want to quote you from page 85 or 115 or 136 again, but he says that the purpose of this new fuel supply arrangement, and by that I mean the consignment and uh, flat fee arrangement, was to approximate what I otherwise would have taken in in rent. So it's all temporary. They're meant to set each other off. Uh, uh, and your client just kind of strong arms and says, we want the part that's good for us. And, and his client says, we'd like to keep the arrangement going forward. Uh, I, I don't see how your client's position is, is a tenable one of what remains of the contract. It's, it's what it was conveyed to it by Mr. Mr. Yoon. Mr. Yoon did testify uh, at, under my examination that the agreement was the rent abatement was temporary and that is what my client assumed my client would not have purchased these properties otherwise or purchased uh, so you're not you're not arguing that your client renegotiated what mr un had previously testified to was an agreement to, um uh, for rent abatement um in, in exchange for a fuel consignment to assist uh mr Brahanu. um you knew, you're saying you didn't know that that was, you weren't aware of that agreement or you didn't think it was valid any longer or that you renegotiated its terms with Mr. Bahanu. I, I, I'm still not clear on what your position is because what you say was assigned by Mr. UN is not what Mr. UN or anybody else says they actually assigned. And then I, I, I'm not sure I hear you suggesting that uh, Mr. Mamo renegotiated the terms of any agreement with Mr. Rahanu either. Mr. Yoon conveyed to our client that the rent abatement was temporary <coughs> and that's the basis that's the basis on which my clients went forward with the purchase it's of temporary and, and and your understanding was it, it therefore expired when and on 30 days notice, it expired when those two March, those two letters that said a change would come in March. I believe the letters were sent in at the end of December of 2012. Right, I think Judge Deal's question, one aspect of Judge Deal's question is, is there direct testimony that Mr. Ewan conveyed to your client that uh, the rent abatement was temporary, but the uh, uh, consignment agreement was unlinked from it and could be, uh, was not temporary and instead would last the, the uh, length of the written lease term. I know the letter in 2013 uh, takes that position, but was there evidence uh, that that was communicated to your client uh, by Mr. Ewan or, uh, 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 or that Mr. Burhanu understood it or anything else that might shed light on if you're again, if you're thinking that your rights here are derivative of Mr. Ewan's, uh, uh, what's the evidence to support the idea that the agreement between Mr. Ewan and Mr. Burhanu was that the rent abatement was temporary, but the consignment agreement lived on unlinked and longer for the entirety of the written lease term? Mr. Ewan's testimony, uh, I believe he testified as to what he conveyed to Mr. Mamo and the other members of Landmark who were at that meeting. His testimony makes that clear. What well, his conveyed. testimony did say, for sure his testimony said, uh, well, I'm sorry, now I'm uh, I, I'm, uh, I may be focusing on Mr. Mamo's testimony now. I mean, there was testimony that uh, people thought that there was no uh, assignment of the supply agreement. I find that very confusing for two reasons. One of them I've mentioned, uh, and I'll reiterate in a second, but the other is I do notice that in the lease for the 12th Street station, there's a paragraph, paragraph 19, that says that notice is hereby given that the landlord has guaranteed the power fuel supply contract dated April 1st, 2001. Uh, and so if Mr. If Landmark is accepting the duties of the original uh, uh, landlord under the lease, why does that not tie, uh, uh, as a matter of the lease terms, uh, uh, landmark to the, you know, to guaranteeing the power fuel supply contract of uh, April 2001. Because they accepted what was assigned to them. And at the time of the assignment, the fuel supply agreements were not in place as verified by Mr. Rahanu's extensive deposition and trial testimony on the subject. 
Okay, and let me, the other thing that puzzles me, and the other thing that puzzles me is if Landmark didn't accept a, 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 let's say, assume for a moment, either the written or an orally modified agreement relating to fuel, uh, then I don't really understand how everybody thought what they did thereafter was lawful. Because, you know, under the prior agreement between Power Fuel and Mr. Burhanu, Power Fuel was going to be the exclusive supplier and Mr. Burhanu was required to work with Power Fuel as the source of, of the fuel that he was uh, selling or consigning, uh, oh, oh, selling uh, 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 on. Um, whereas once Landmark comes into the picture, everybody seems to think, okay, Landmark can now fill the role of power fuel under that old agreement, which you know by its terms is still running. It was tied to the length of the lease. Um, and so unless Landmark assumed whether again, orally modified or as written, the fuel, a, a, an agreement relating to fuel. I don't, under, I don't understand how uh, any of the actions of anybody going forward was lawful or consistent with the, or the earlier agreement. The only way Landmark could do what it did uh, would have been if it uh, you know, uh, 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 obtained by assignment the, from, from uh, power fuel, the ability to be kind of the exclusive supplier and Mr. Brahana then could lawfully work with Landmark and sell its fuel rather than power fuels. Am I do, do, so? So do you? This gets back to I guess if if I if, if I understand the trial court to have said there was no assignment of any contractual obligation from Power Fuel to Landmark relating to fuel. It was only a real estate lease. Um, if I understand the trial court to have said that, I'm having a hard time understanding how that could be right. And uh, can you explain to me? Do you think it is right that your client got from by assignment? no legal obligations relative to Mr. Burhano and his entities relating to fuel. And the only thing your client got by assignment was, you know, a real estate lease. Absolutely. The one, uh, the documents show that uh, Mr. Resnikoff in his brief seems to focus on documents that have a line entry for other contracts other than leases that are being assigned in the sales agreements between power fuels and landmark. But when you go to the page, it should be Exhibit B, it's blank and doesn't list any assignments. Also, you have to credit Mr. Brahanu's testimony itself, saying that he jettisoned the fuel supply agreement and was quite happy to replace that with the consignment agreement. So long as and, he had a and, reservation. And the abatement. He was only well, um, happy, uh, grateful to do that if he got the rent abatement. Um, let me, you know, I, we're, we, I know we've been talking a lot about this contract because we are still having many questions, as you can see, but I want to know what you would say about um, Mr. Bahanu's unjust enrichment claim, um, uh, which is that, um, you know, you just weren't paying him anything. He wasn't getting the profits from the, the fuel under, under, under your new fuel agreement, and he wasn't getting the rent abatement. And, and therefore, um, your client, Mr. Mama, was being unjustly enriched at his expense. I think that's a simple answer. You can't, by law, you can't have an unjust enrichment claim when there is a contract in place. There was a contract in place for consignment. So uh, was Bahar there? What, which con? <laughs> I mean, which? It, what you seem to be referring to as the fuel contract seems to me to be a unilateral determination by um, Mr. Mamo that I'm going to uh, give fuel um, that I get from my own source. So it's not fuel that was referred to in the original written agreement. It's not fuel that Mr. UN was supplying under their oral modification temporarily. It's a whole new deal that, that, that your client unilaterally um, basically ordered Mr. Mamu to comply with. And there's no consideration, there's no acceptance, there's no, I mean, uh, and, and it, it, it doesn't also flow from the assignee and assignment theory either because um, there, there seems to be a significant question, at least in my mind, that what was assigned to Mr. Mamu by Mr. UN was very different than what Mr. Yuen, I mean, Mr. Mamo tried to implement. So under either 
theory that I could see a contract being in place, there are gaps. Um, and I don't understand how it can't be assigned when Mr. Farhanu agreed to it, lived under it from 2009 through 2013 when Landmark uh, obtained the ownership interest. They well, well, no, he didn't because he, he, when you say the lived under it, Mr. Mr. Uh, Bahano didn't pay uh, rent for the space. Um, um, he, he, it seems to me that he was uh, protesting by his actions of failing to comply with uh, what your client viewed as the contract. It seems, it may seem to the court, but Mr. Bahanu did not actually ever protest. He did not ever say anything in response to the two letters for a couple of years. And the parties lived under that agreement. But he continued um, with the rent abatement. He wasn't paying rent. I mean, I, you keep saying that he, he testified that this consignment flat fee was in place. And you're right, he did say that. But he said it with the understanding with, in exchange for the rent abatement. And so, I mean, I don't, it doesn't get you that far, counsel. If we we're going to carry it all over, then what happened was he really carried out his part of the agreement. He remitted the proceeds to you guys. Uh, there was no flat fee remitted to him. And then you guys want the rent as well, which should have been abated under the, the agreement that was brought in. And I know you're going to tell me the rent abatement was temporary. But what I'm saying to you is that it was all temporary and one doesn't go without the other. If you have the rent abatement, you also have the, the rent abatement flows directly from the consignment and flat fee arrangement. That was the exchange, you know, I'll stop paying you rent and I get to stop keeping the proceeds and we'll enter this consignment agreement. But you don't get to take back the rent abatement and keep your half of the deal. Like at no point does Mr. Burhanu say that was his understanding. Right? When does Mr. Burhanu say, yes, I understood that consignment agreement to carry over, but not, but that the abatement was temporary? I don't know that he does. He doesn't say that. It's not, it's not reasonable, counsel. It's not reasonable for, for the half of the deal that's good for, for your client to carry over and the half of the deal that's good for him not to. But what the court... Oh. Mr. Moore, I know we, you, you see we have, have some, some questions and appreciate <laughs> you, you, <laughs> your, your, your efforts to respond. Um, there, there is a, a, a cross appeal. Did you want to uh, uh, briefly take a moment? I know we've taken you over your time to, to address that. The cross appeal is uh, directly related to the Superior Court's ruling in favor of landmark for rent and uh, I don't think anything more really needs to be say, said on that issue than what was briefed. I think it's pretty clear under the leases and the law that my clients, if they were entitled, they're entitled to, which they are, judgments for non-payment of rent, that under the leases, they would be entitled to late fees and interest. So I don't, I don't want to brief that or argue about that here, I, okay. unless the court has any questions. All right, any further uh, questions for Mr. Moore? All right, thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, uh, Mr. Reznikoff, uh, you have reserved a couple minutes for rebuttal. And you, you're, you're muted. If you could unmute yourself, Mr. Reznikoff. Better, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, uh, the main point I want to drill down on is the rudiment, really, that uh, in terms of testimony that Mr. Moore has referred to uh, involving Mr. Yuan and, uh, and, and my client, I would re reiterate the point that I think the documents from 2013 are the best evidence of what the agreement is, uh, uh, that, uh, what went on before 2013. And, and states what I think the, uh, uh, the landmark and Mr. Mamo's companies are, are bound to. And beyond that, I'm not going to uh, uh, com comment further. All right, are there any uh, further questions for Mr. Uh, Reznikov? All right, uh, uh, council would like to thank both of you for your uh, briefs and 
arguments under spirited questioning. Um, we appreciate your, your responses to each of our, our questions on this, um, on this uh, issue, um, which is a complex matter in this case. So thank you. Uh, and I think that concludes our um, matters for today. Um, and thank you all. You, you can exit out of the virtual courtroom at this, at this juncture. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. This court is now adjourned.